So we are now streaming and what I'll do is I'll go investigate the link and uh, start hooking the link up on my various pages. So I appreciate uh, Mr. Moon being with us. You actually have no idea how glad I am you're uh, with us tonight. It's uh, one of those nights where uh, I feel much better to have someone with me rather than uh, hold it alone because it's another one of those nights where I'm just really uh, not uh, all here, so to speak. Well, it's also like when you're by yourself, you're kind of talking to a freezer or something, you know, it's that's, you know, it's not easy to just talk into a, uh, into a void, so to speak. It's, it's better to have a prop. Yes, yes, it always uh, feels better that way. And uh, definitely uh, glad to uh, have uh, faces out there that I recognize as well. A uh, lovely young lady who sent me the... Uh, Sandwich crems, the uh, chocolate uh, uh, cane sugar. Uh, I, I hesitate to call them Oreos. They're very much like the Oreos cookies, but I was just eating them to give myself enough sugar jag to uh, have energy to continue forward. Uh, she's out there waving, and I say hello to her. I think she wants to remain anonymous for now, so I'm just going to protect her identity. But uh, we're going to speak a little bit about... Uh, uh, Crystal Rivers, only in the sense that we're sorry that um, she's not with us right now, and she will be with us after my colonoscopy procedure, which will be December 9th, and sometime uh, within the week after that, more than likely, uh, Peter Moon and Crystal Rivers will be with us. And we have three people at least uh, right now, so that means it's usually orders of magnitude above that. Uh, Derek Talley, our man, has left a comment. Now, by the way, I'm kind of fulfilling your role right now by just speaking aloud. Uh, but uh, feel free to interrupt. And uh, Derek Talley says, we are loud and clear. God bless you, dear brother. I spoke uh, to your uh, dear friend, Mr. Weaver, I believe his name is. Uh, and I believe his name is Patrick Weaver, it might be. It um, takes me several times with names. But hopefully Mr. Talley can appear with uh, Mr. Weaver and myself in a future transmission. As a matter of fact, let me go straight to the inbox for just a second in my public community fan page there. And uh, Patrick Weaver, that is the man's name. So hopefully Derek Talley can appear with Patrick Weaver and myself in the near future. And uh, he can kind of uh, fulfill the role that you're fulfilling right now. And um, let me test out the link. We're going to hear an echo here. And uh, I'm giving Mr. Moon a break because uh, uh, Mr. Moon, uh, you know, uh, there we are. Okay, I can see our link coming up. Now I have to unmute because... Uh, and uh, I hear Moon, echo. Uh, Good. That's excellent. Okay, we've got echo. And uh, uh, darn. Okay, didn't want that. Let's take a look at this. Here we are. Got the link. Okay, then we're going to test that again, see if we can uh, generate another echo uh, for a few seconds. And, uh, all right. Enter. Yeah. Uh, for a few seconds. Good. Got another and, echo. Uh, okay, everything is working. Uh, Derek Talley is being very supportive. He's showing the uh, support link. Uh, God bless him. And we will now go over to my three pages and begin to change the text on my promotional banners. It is 4.44 p.m. on uh, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, so I'm going to allow Mr. Moon to kind of take over for several minutes to the top of the hour. Of course, uh, I can grunt and uh, make various other affirmative noises if he needs me to. And uh, I'll let him know when I'm kind of back with him. So in the meantime, Mr. Moon will be asking our listeners to help uh, test uh, quality of sound. Uh, so everybody let him know how he sounds. Well, I'm not going to be able to see how any response, am I? Um, oh, yeah. You can just look at oh, Facebook oh, timelines. You know. Oh, yeah. I'm not, okay. Uh, I'm going to have to go to uh, your timeline then. Oh, either that or... Oh, um, you shared you shared the promotional banner, so they should be responding on your page. Oh, I, I, I am there. Okay, yeah. loud and clear. Yes, I see Derek's uh, Derek's comment, Great. and uh, it should be fine. So we'll talk about what I'll talk about right now, since we're talking about. Oh, this is funny. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> uh, I was reading a dream I had many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was working on my book, The White Bat. And there was this character, I might have talked about him before, um, Bernard Mendez. Mm -hmm. But, but or, uh, just a little bit of clarification here. I have a copy of The White Bat that was, I, I'm very grateful to have had it gifted to me by, by Mr. Moon. On the cover is Paula, his lovely wife. And uh, so um, my impression was that The White Bat couldn't have been written that long ago because you didn't marry your wife that long ago. It must have only been written, what, half a decade ago at the longest, right? Um. Gee, I remember getting the rushes for the book, having a lot of problems with the printer when I was visiting her in 2014. Mm -hmm. I, I was in Romania and I was actually, you know, telling them they had the cover wrong and well, and the printer. I was, uh, they were frustrating me to help. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so this 2014, it came out in 2014. Right. That's when the book was out. That's five years ago. Uh, that's the same year I met you. Incredible. And yes, I probably gave it to you when we met. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, well, that's a very interesting book. But um, so while I was um, there, was this this guy named uh, Bernard Mendez, and he was a, a you know sort of a colleague of uh, Andy Visaggio. All right. Ah. Okay. And and he had approached me at a meeting in. Um, in uh, New Jersey, and I was I was there. I think uh, I had a table selling books at a, at a UFO conference that I was invited to. And he comes up to me and he says, "I'm BJM, BJM." You know that was his initials. And I go, well, "What do you mean you're BJM?" He says, "It's in the book. You know, BJM is uh, the name of the company that Preston worked for." Mm -hmm. But it very clearly stated in the book that BJM was a you know a a fake name. Right. In fact, in fact, you would have been interested. I chose the name BJM because it was the letters were adjacent to AIL, which was the name of the real company that Preston worked for, Airborne Instruments Laboratory. Uh. And and this was the same thing because you were talking about HAL and yes. IBM, the, the computer, uh, yes. in 2001, and and he had taken the uh, the name HAL because it was H A L with the letters next to IBM. So if I was going to make up a, a phony name, a phony name of initials, I did the same thing he did. Instead of taking HAL, which are the letters next to IBM, I took BJM right next to AIL and to see if anybody could figure it out. Well, nobody ever even tried to figure it out. However, um, this guy thought it identified with him. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, patently absurd, you know, and of course, no, this is not you. This is just a name of a company Preston worked for. Uh -huh. But he identified with it so strongly. And he he, he, thought he had a, a strong identification with Montauk and told me how he was sent out to, to, you know, get rid of the beast and consult with him and help shut the project down. Now, I didn't know if, it, if he was, you know, where he was talking from. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned it when we went out to eat. He was there, and then he got he got upset. He says, "You shouldn't have mentioned anything about this." Okay, well. <laughs> so so then he wanted to to go out to Montauk with me, and I said, "Oh well, I, I thought maybe I didn't tell him this, but I thought maybe I could get him on video, and maybe it might be interesting because I, I wasn't quite sure where he was at at this point." And then he, um, so I arranged for him to come out, and then he said. Uh, Okay, he says, uh, I will need $50 uh, for gas money and, um, and um, uh, what, what else did he want? It's already uh, shaking oh, you down, yeah. <laughs> to sign me a release, to sign a release that, I, you know, that everything he tells me is, you know, his property and all this stuff. And, oh, delightful. And, delightful. And, I, and I, I mean, you know, and so anyway, I was going to ask him. You know, if to see if you know, record him and see if he wanted to do that. But he didn't know that I was going to ask him that. So anyway, when I saw this, I said, "No, I said, don't worry about the gas money." I said, "I, I deal with the, you know, his release. You know, when I when he when he got here." But I said, "Don't," I said, "Don't worry about the." Uh, no, I said, "I'm going to drive. You're not going. It's not going to cost you any gas." Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, "No, I meant to, from the gas to get to your house." <laughs> and I said, 
you know, and I said, oh, well, you know, I, I said, and then I told him something came up. I, I didn't want to deal with this person. Right. Because this is like really kind of like really this, this guy's off. And then I would get emails from his friends saying, you know, he's interested in pharaohs. He's, he knows <laughs> a lot about pharaohs. Uh, and, and I'm thinking like, and, and, you know, because I've written about the Montauk pharaohs and it, sometimes people will, you know, it's like he's trying to sell me on it. You know, it's like uh, if he hears I like ice cream, you know, I'm bringing ice cream. You know, it's like, I mean, what, what, what does this have to do with anything? I, I hear you. It's, and, uh... But this this is the funny thing. Uh-huh. Now, he went on, I, I he went on uh, Carrie Cassidy. Uh-huh. And why she interviews, you know, 99% of the people she has on there, I can't, I can't answer. <laughs> she's filling but, in time. I mean, she's just, you know. But, well, see, that's the problem. When you have a show, thank you. You're yes. in you're in the carnival business. It, yes. it doesn't matter. Yes. So you take you know just like Ed Sullivan used to have everybody on. Um, you know you kind of have to, you know, pander to to what what's available. Yes. So anyway, what what he uh, he went on there and, and you know said that he was a, a liaison between the government and Department Zero. Mm. Uh, Department Zero is of course the the actually the pseudonym for the, the most secret aspect of Romanian intelligence, which has put out these books that I've published. And it's a, it's a real, it's a real unit. A lot of people like to tell me they know the real truth about it, but they don't. Uh, and anyway, it does, I do know that it exists uh, from my own context there, but you know, so he's saying he's the liaison between the departments. So he reads these books and he projects himself into you know into the mix right into the narrative yeah and he does not belong in the narrative in fact he's an embarrassment to the narrative right and he's sitting there and he's kind of like oh, i'm the lady the driver zero and it's like you know i mean this is like get the cane out and well, well don't you think this individual might be a paid agent to uh to basically discredit the issue i mean that's that's quite conceivable isn't it uh no i don't think he's a paid agent i think he's somebody with a lot of psychological insecurities mm-hmm. who will reach out to identify and grab onto it in, in hopes of, you know, having some sort of semblance of, you know, attention, meaning, <laughs> meaning in his life. Yeah. And so anyway, uh, he appears to me and this, you'll get a really kick out of this. So anyway, I, I mean, and so anyway, uh, with another friend of mine, I, I refer to him as the goat of Mendez because, you know, of course, the goat of Mendez is the, the Egyptian deity that is all tied to uh, inspired Baphomet and, and at least illustrations of Baphomet and was the, you know. So anyway, the, I just think of it, refer to him as the goat of Mendez. And anyway, uh, he actually was uh, being glad handed to some extent by Andrew Bartzies, who finally had to cut him off, you know, because <laughs> he just it was too much. And, uh, um, you know, because uh, you know, um, Andrew has has a definite amount of compassion for certain people, and right. uh, but it, but enough was enough. So anyway, a- he appears- actually, I, I could I could uh, give further details on that later about uh, how Andrew Bartzies has uh, a little bit too much of an envelope of tolerance, so I can relate to him completely. <laughs> so go on, yes, well, yeah. Well, anyway, so so what happened? And this is where you get the kick of it. So he appears to me in a dream, this guy, mm-hmm. and. He appears and he comes up to me and he goes, I'm the white bat. Now, the white bat has not <laughs> been released yet. Nobody knows about the white bat. So, but it's all right. He was superimposing himself on my work and identifying himself as white bats, a, a damned interesting uh, archetype. Uh, very interesting. And we can even go into that on the broadcast if we want. But it's. Um, but anyway, so he identifies himself as the white bat. And I'm going like, oh, you know, and I said, well, what is your name? And he then gives me a name. And the name he gives me is Ad- uh, Adelaide, as in Australia, mm-hmm. which I, I find out, you know, I look it up. It means the noble one, Adelaide. But the other name is sort of, it's like Adiank or Aniank. It's Aniank. Uh, and so I was going through. And I could never find out what Aniank meant. And I did a, uh, an anic- I was going through the dream. I was looking for something and I found it. And I, I found my write-up of the dream. And Aniank, uh, when I put it in an anagram solver, it means 
it, it reads out as Q inane. <laughs> oh, that's apt. That's a apropos. Yes. Yeah, and that's before, of course, Q was a phenomenon. Yes. And uh, because the the white bat is such a deep archetypal thing, mm -hmm. and I I had definitely uh, encountered you prior to this time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't remember if I first heard of you in 2013 or 14. I do know that I had a major, it was probably, I first probably encountered you in 13, mm -hmm. but I, I had this major incident in 14 when my, uh, you know, my elect, I had a, a flood, flood of water was leaking down into my electric box and I had to get the entire thing replaced. Just before, the day before I went to, to see Paula in Holy Romania. Shit. <laughs> I mean, that, no, that was the day I had it finished that time. You know, mm -hmm. I, I had the contractor here and it, that was all, you know, as far as I was concerned, it was all Aquino related, right. uh, it, energetically, not, right. not, not that he sent somebody out to burst my pipe because he didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was, uh, no, that, that was a whole adventure. Right. Right. I, I think that that's uh, that's that's definitely amusing, as you say, and be amusing as well. Uh, definitely. Uh, the White Bat is very much a book about how to write books in many respects. It's about bringing stuff up from the subconscious. And um, what Mr. Moon is describing is that very process. There's a lot of stuff that was coming up from his subconscious uh, that this individual kind of wrote in on. And uh, as for um, Aquino, of course, that was... Uh, part of uh <clears throat> the general phenomena of what was going on and uh what i'll have to do is let me turn these phones off i forgot to do that before i started uh tonight which goes to show everyone uh how out of it i am <laughs> and we are headed towards a few minutes towards the top of the hour very thankful uh to mr moon for uh bringing up uh that uh story and or that experience and um sorry just as i'm shutting down this phone i see that two children have died in the floods in arizona with all of the weather that we've been having so uh sorry to um relay that report and uh other than that a power off on this phone as well and that'll prevent um odd electronic noises from uh happening which is uh what happened the other night of course when i uh uh, woke up um, and had to uh, break out the electric blankets and heating pad that were sent to myself from my manager, Elena Shea, and, uh, and, and basically get them all affixed to uh, the mattress that she had sent me. And uh, this, of course, uh, enabled me to pretty much survive the night uh, in what otherwise uh, was just too cold a night to... Uh, to live through uh and i i mean that quite literally physically uh i i've been just uh too lazy to um add these heating pads and uh electric blankets to the one that i had which was more like a summer electric blanket and the summertime electric blanket at full uh, blast was not cutting it and i was just waking up uh frigid in a fetal position with my muscles all cramped and uh my bones all uh creaking and uh uh honestly it's 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 life threatening there's 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 no other way to describe it because i live in a crypt there's no heating in here and it's just a, a few steps up from being homeless and um, anyone who didn't have the electrical amenities like I did, um, basically my best friends in this situation are electric blankets and uh, uh, my blow dryer. Uh, but uh, it, it's like living in Alaska, but it, it's, uh, it, it's worse because most people in Alaska would have heat that would heat up their entire uh, um, home, which I do not have. Um, so there's limits. Let me recommend if somebody could uh, send Douglas a Dyson fan, D Y S O N. These things are incredible. Uh, they they can serve as a as a cooling unit or as a fan. Uh, they're incredible, incredible pieces of technology. Uh, Dyson fans. If if anybody out there, uh, you know, can be so uh, generous. But but and, how does how, 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 doesn't take up a lot of energy. How, how does that help with the situation of the cold, though? It's a heater. Oh, I see. So it's so, a whole room, and it oh, heats it very efficiently. Uh, it's a D Y S O N. I mean, you, can, you know, it's like uh, I, I got one uh, in uh, 
it's uh, it's really good to use. Uh, okay. It just takes the the sting out of coldness if I don't have the whole heating system on. Interesting. Well, I definitely appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, There's different sizes. Like mm -hmm. I have a, a big one because I, I got a big room, big house, a big room that I use it in. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can, uh, and as I say, it's much more efficient than, and it takes much less energy than some of these, uh, your typical heater, electric right. Right. Well, well, definitely appreciate you bringing that up. I'll certainly investigate that. And uh, so we'll, we'll look more into that in the uh, very near future. And uh, in the meantime, we're very blessed to have uh, the Mr. Peter Moon with us tonight. He is, of course, the investigative author. He is uh, known for his researches into the Montauk Project. In particular, uh, I'm going to, of course, uh, take advantage of his presence and ask him to stay probably longer than the opening hour he and I can uh, chat for a while uh, concerning various things that uh, come to mind. And uh, we're going to uh, get into all of it uh, within a very short period of time. Though I do ask uh, Peter Moon to be patient because I'm going to essentially go through the opening blurb. And so, uh, Mr. Moon, if you need to take care of anything at this point, kind of uh, grab something or make yourself some more tea or something like that, feel free to do so. I'm going to, in the interim, probably take up the next, uh, it'll probably take a good 10 to 15 minutes, uh, hopefully just around 10. Uh, this is the first time I've read the expanded blurb that we've prepared, and it includes a public service warning about the uh, last individual who was working with myself, assigned by Aquino. And uh, when you and I are talking, I'll, I'll bring up someone else who approached me uh, via the electronics. Now that now Parkinson is gone, there's been a replacement for him already. And uh, we can contextualize that within the overall narrative of our experiences. But in the meantime, I do want to remind everybody that that we had a hell of a time with uh, Brendan Young and myself. Uh, oh, by the way, were you going to say something, Peter? I'm sorry, were you, you just uh, going to no, I wasn't. You go ahead and I'll be here in 10 minutes. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Uh, going to remind everyone that uh, we had a uh, enormous uh, problem recently with the reformatting of YouTube. Uh, so uh, we want to give credit and all due propers to one of the reasons that reformatting happened because it had to happen. And a lot of that was uh, thanks to uh, the burden on the shoulders of my manager as Lena Shea, who was uh, astute enough to actually turn in uh, multiple photographs to YouTube uh, and through the channels that I was exploiting along with my 3D graphics modeler so that they would be aware that there was a softcore uh, pedo pornographic uh, pirating operation that was making literally millions of dollars off of YouTube involving, of course, uh, the Aquino network. And uh, this was uh, something that was taken down and it took um, several years to actually Actually bring it down but uh, during about uh, two years ago uh, screenshots were provided to myself by uh, Lena Shea wherein she discovered that there were videos of young children that were being given uh, various uh, teething uh, instruments uh, to gnaw upon but these teething instruments were essentially dildos and uh, the children uh, gnawing on these dildos were being photographed and filmed, the videos uploaded onto YouTube. This was very definitely uh, pedopornography, uh, literally at the infantile level of uh, both uh, exploitation and uh, the mentation of the exploiters, and as well as the infants being exploited. It was infantile at all levels, but at the same time quite sinister and quite... Um, uh, just, just awful. And so um, this, uh, along with the comments where people were pointing out how to appreciate or how best to uh, masturbate or sexually gratify oneself uh, via this video, most of the time these comments were overwhelmingly in Russian. And as I mentioned before, one of the uh, big industrial outputs uh, that uh, Russia reaches out to the world with, especially under sanctions, is pornography. Um, anyone who cruises for pornography readily, as I openly admit to doing, uh, one thing that becomes uh, inescapable is the overwhelming presence of Russian pornography on the Internet. They, they dominate uh, the industry internationally. 
and that's because their people have nothing else to to do to produce other than weapons uh, to sell uh, and smuggle around the world. This is one of the mainstays of their economy. This is what life is like under Vladimir Putin. So uh, the direct result of YouTube's response to all this was what was known as uh, Adpocalypse 2.0. And uh, so Google's uh, video site uh, was uh, basically uh, having to explain itself as to why all of the major advertisers fled over the pedophile scandal, uh, and it's taken them till now to begin to reformat YouTube so that people have to put up age blocks. Uh, it's now required by YouTube that age blocks be placed up on videos like mine own, and this is all for the best, and uh, it makes it far less uh, easy to knock down my videos, and uh, it enabled us to knock Henrik Palmgren off YouTube because Henrik Palmgren was, of course, very much part of this entire pedopiracy operation. And uh, that's what knocked him off far more than anything he was saying politically. And uh, so when it comes to advertisers like Disney, Nestle, Epic Games, the makers of Fortnite, one of the most popular video games in the world. They pulled out of YouTube uh, over the pedophile scandal, or rather the latest uh, pedophile super scandal about uh, a year and a half ago, and uh, or last year, making it hard for thousands of good channels like our own to survive. So I spoke of the Office of War Information in World War II, how uh, it uh, went black, went off the books, and uh, became very much a uh, part of the black budget operations of the United States government. And it runs C2C, or Coast to Coast AM. That's what our friend Mr. Moon is with us tonight to explain. It's just how Coast to Coast AM was misrepresenting a subject, which is his specialty. And so Coast to Coast AM, of course, uh, is administered uh, by Bobby Ray Inman, uh, the former head of the Federal Reserve uh, branch in Texas. And uh, he was, of course, a rear admiral or an admiral. Uh, and um, he's retired as an admiral, uh, still active in consultation because of his heavy intelligence background. The overwhelming majority of his resume is classified. But one of the men working for him while in the Navy was George Norrie. And George Norrie, of course, is a spin doctor for the United States Navy. And uh, the way that um, uh, Bobby Ray Inman uh, runs Coast to Coast AM is through Clear Channel. Clear Channel, of course, in turn, is uh, got a huge stake owned by Billy Joe Red McCombs, one of the richest men in the world per Fortune magazine, and uh, former um, uh, co-owner of Blackhawk, uh, or excuse me, Blackwater uh, Mercenary Corporation, which had to change its name to avoid multiple lawsuits. And uh, Billy Joe Red McCombs, uh, he runs Premier Radio Network, and uh, answers to uh, Rear Admiral Bobby Ray Edmond and uh, the individual answering to both of them uh, through the premier radio network Clear Channel chain of command is uh, George Norrie. And uh, so he, of course, is an ardent Satanist. Uh, he only had me on because I was able to give him the password from Michael Aquino that made him think I was a fellow Edomite, a fellow cultist. And uh, what these people have done is they've refused to invest in people. They only invest in other cultists, as recommended by Michael Aquino. It's always the same people over and over again, Richard Dolan and Peter Lavinda, because, of course, these are the Aquino cultists who Aquino is promoting. And that's who you're going to hear on Coast to Coast AM. That's why channels like mine are so important. And, uh, of course, channels like mine rely on people in the most immediate sense. That's what we invest in. Uh, people like Brendan Zogit, people like my 3D graphics modeler, who uh, forever wants to remain anonymous, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, who help us with uh, research, uh, video editing, and uh, graphics. So when it comes to uh, all of this, uh, none of this would be possible uh, without you. So you can contribute to the struggle at showsdd.com forward slash donate.html. We're now accepting PayPal 
on showsdd.com. And we open this transmission with a shout out unto my own personal hero, our dearest English brother in battle, who be the Team Thrak, the Thrick or Dragon Archivist at showsdd.com, and YouTube uh, Maggot Channel Property Manager, which you can subscribe to his channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Magator, Magator being spelled M A G O T A U R. That individual, the Grand Magator, being John Henry II McMills Warrington. You can friend and follow he. Uh, via his Facebook timeline at facebook.com forward slash John dot war for were it no for he nigh all my videographic works would have been lost twas he who saved nigh all the Douglas Dietrich videos published on platform provided by YouTube that would have otherwise been erased from all free public accessibility and monopolized for privatized monetization via Patreon via the openly sub-satanic welfare supported white trash Pueblo Colorado based amateur sorceress Amber Rose Dio who's my stick Warrior channel actively exploited YouTube to promote Adomite Thalema or will of Peter Simon Lavinda, known as Simon because he is, of course, the author of the Simon Necronomicon, uh, aged uh, 69 years at this point, uh, and of course, uh, still a threat to uh, all humanity, but particularly to children whom uh, his works were being exposed to by Amber Rose Dio prior her exposure, and via his own so-called Dietrichology YouTube channel by the parentally aided and abetted violent alcoholic Euro trash Canadian multiple sexual assaults offender Pavel Edward Privara, who resides in his federally pensioned parents' Toronto domicile and aliases himself as Paul Edward via the his Facebook timeline, whereon he hides still behind images of myself, to friend underage boys precepts predation. Uh, and here in, in where we've found it uh, basically implored upon us to provide an alert and an actoon, a warning uh, to all friends, fans, and followers of myself. Uh, basically a public service warning to Bolo or be on the lookout per the Pato Predator, Pavel Edward, or Paul Edward Pravara. Uh, and, of course, uh, this public figure is the former executive producer of my program, who was caught red-handed attempting to archive my entire Google account after having hacked it via the our co-managed Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel. Uh, and he is a cyber terrorist with a known criminal record. Uh, and, of course, he brazenly self-promotes his quote-unquote self-employment behind my own image uh, as an expert in quote-unquote, Jap. Uh, so, Paul Provera referencing himself as a data engineer and then producing my program make as little sense beyond hyperbole and the citing of Jap as his quote-unquote employer or rather his field of employment as he be presenting himself as self-employed thereby indirectly but publicly self-asserting his unemployability make as no sense at all beyond the intended entendre as ethnic slur against myself Jap otherwise being acronymous for a software Java Anon Proxy which you can find out more about at the site Fresh Meat appropriately enough, freshmeat.sourceforge.net forward slash projects forward slash anon, as in anonymous. Similar to Tor, the onion rooter, as in multi-layered, which itself be likewise exploitable in hiding our encrypting IP or internet protocol addresses by moving through multiple routers, which is a dark web tool employed throughout the pedopornographic industry, precepts, praterast, predations. Uh, Jap being similar thereunto, but Jap itself being relatively new, released in December of 2016, as well as concurrently deployable to hide web browsing. So Paul Pravara thereby openly promoting himself as a data engineer in the realm of child exploitation and baby rape advertising, unto others his own ability to deep dive into the depths of deepest darkness and assist others in such. His about section in LinkedIn uh, reads, my objectives remain the same, resolve data problems through abstraction, which all too obviously make us no sense whatsoever, a silly string of terms comprising a non-sequitorial word salad, a data engineer develops, constructs, tests, and maintains architectures, such as databases and large-scale processing systems, which altogether might be occulted, it is obfuscated, as abstracting data problems, but it is not how anyone seriously seeking employment would advertise themselves. Instead, Polyboy presumes any potential contractor to read, as in to interpret, his pithy about statement as, I exploit Jap, 
to resolve data problems, it has transmission of questionable data through abstraction, meaning cascading and mixing the data streams of multiple users in order to further obfuscate, it has to cull the data to outsiders, which be what Jap does. So both Pauli Boy and his handler Agnieszka Maria Schrozinska uh, promote themselves as hackers. It would be self-evidently stupid to advertise oneself as such via LinkedIn Corporation by all common sensibilities, but they have been emboldened uh, by the Temple of Set to hide in plain sight. Pauli's entire linked entry being utterly senseless by any conventional rationale other than within this context. Ergo, Paul Prevara be advertising more than meets the eye. Anyone doing a search on LinkedIn for Jap specifically in disambiguation uh, from Jap with an uppercase J and everything else lowercase, I mean Jap all uppercase, would, instead of pulling up uh, racist remarks about the Nifojin or Japanese people's restaurants or the empire of greater Japan itself, if you enter Jap in all caps, you will come across the page of Pavel Pravara, and most likely not many more. With the nebulous statement of resolve data problems through abstraction, it is via encryption being the key. Anyone who wants help in questionable tasks requiring Jap now be directed to his page exclusively, his page alone. His critical omission of blatant hypocrisy, what speaks volumes in and of and for itself, being that he refuses to explain his openly published public statement per myself, as to why he still misrepresents himself by hiding behind the photograph of a quote-unquote liar on his facebook.com forward slash PI342 instead of his own flaccid, uh, fish-belly white European trash face. For reasons that be all too obvious, no one would friend him by his own wretched appearance, despite the fact that he tells underage minors that they have finally found Waldo of the Where's Waldo franchise, and that Waldo really was Harry Potter, his other preferred self-misrepresentation all along. Now, both the identified malefactors, Rose Dio and Pauli Provara, ultimately boasted themselves activated assets of the Temple of Set founder, the Sethistic, it is Satanic High Priest and primary Wikipedia contributor, Dr. Michael Angelo Aquino, and uh, his ever-swelling cult of the kings of Edom, it is the anti-gods. But now you too can do your part to help in the fight against total annihilation. Spread the word about Douglas Dietrich that he, the biological son of Adolphus Jacob Hitler, which you can find out more about at douglasdietrich.com forward slash 2019 forward slash 05 forward slash 08 forward slash Douglas Dietrich son of Adolf Hitler fighting against white supremacist neo-Nazis and confer a footnote on my bio sire uh, to find out more about what be in his name and what his name be all about uh, that uh, his son be alive and well and resident in the city and county of San Francisco and if at all possible electronically relay thy contributions at showsdd.com forward slash donate.html which be acronymous for hypertext markup language people are forever asking myself what they can do to fight the pedo pathophilocracy such being our present slavo western government by patriarchy of pathological pedophiles you can all help spread awareness by supporting myself. We have a new contribution page on DouglasDietrich.com where you can make a donation online using either thy credit or debit card. Simply go to DouglasDietrich.com and click the red donate button. All sponsors will be granted exclusive electronic access to both my videographic and audio recorded archives through to this year from the 2011th year of our Lord, the very year my late and sainted Cyrus, uh, Diana Sujin Lin, Takabayashi Hideto Dietrich was assassinated. Uh, nigh immediately aftermath, the Fukushima Daiichi terror attacks uh, on 311, a date as infamous in Japan as 9-11 is here in the United States. Uh, the same year, of course, that the Native American uh, communities reckoned uh, via their cosmologies that the first rays of the dawning of the sixth world broke upon us and magics could again be worked conjointly with Mother Earth to redeem the folk upon her. They're not on YouTube anymore. So visit showsdd.com forward slash donate.html and donate online where it is fast, easy, and secure. Only on contribution will that membership be processed within 48 through 72 hours, between 2 to 3 days. 
for full access to all mine archives, meaning all those videos that John Warrington saved aside those on the Maggot Douglas Dietrich channel and the YouTube channel named Taboo Bros 2, uh, as managed by mixed martial arts maestro Daniel LaRolla of Damage Inc., or Daniel LaRolla Martial Arts Group Incorporated, Kali Combatives. Yeso, so, all the Magator-backed, Dietrich-hosted vids now be available onto uh, all, uh, excepting, of course, uh, via the, the uh, aforementioned TB2 and Maggot channels, which have their own uh, Douglas Dietrich videos. All those that are not on those are on our extensive shows, dd.com archives, now including even the old ostensibly professed Revolution Radio archives obtained from the late and unlamented controlled oppositionist Mike Ringley by the well-established alternative acid rock band Deep Space Pilots lead bandsman Ronald P. Stroyney. And, of course, uh, you can uh, find all the American Freedom Radio episodes, what few there be from the month or so I worked there, uh, in the same DouglasDietrich.com archives. And they're only to be found there once upon you click that red donate button. Now, on tra past transmissions, I've informed our listeners about the option to send us checks or money orders to my own physical mailing address in order to avoid paying the middle person. So my manager, Lena Shea, has asked myself to clarify unto our audience that I was referring to merchant services, as said middle person and not herself, who be an unremunerated volunteerist. As my webmistress, the young Madame Lady Shea, has been e-relaying thank you communique on my own behalf unto everyone who submits their donations online. My presently transitional website situation is in no way, shape, or form analogous to the Aquino-designated suppression asset Lorian Ann Fenton handling in which she was assigned to sabotage all my contacts or uh, per potential sponsors and all my communications via the, the open public will stealing any and all incoming fiscal succor intended for myself as her personal profits. So, fear goddess and dread not, whether you send donations online or through the postal services, it will reach myself now. Accepting online donations cost us roughly 3%, uh, more or less, to process, so you can help us save a few extra United States dollars by mailing either checks or money orders, never cash, to the personal residential address of the Mr. Douglas Dietrich, which itself be listed on DouglasDietrich.com. The most important thing being that people regularly donate what they can within their means. Foremost among my donors, aside my lady and mistress Lena herself, be our most beloved greater British brother in battle, the Team Drac, uh, He-Man heavyweight lifter, and YouTube a Bizarre HD channel manager, uh, George Knight of YouTube.com forward slash user forward slash Bizarre HD, spelled B-I-Z-A-R-E-H-D, all one word, all uppercase if you wish. Uh, friend him at facebook.com forward slash george dot e dot night dot seven. Our own personal hero who has substantially delivered towards my salvation from the streets and whose self-produced videos entitled How the United States Won World War One and Why We Are Still Legally at War with the Third Reich be factually substantiated per my known expositions. Indeed, my expositions via YouTube would not be possible sans generous benefactions from my listeners on a monthly basis. I am the only person on the surface of this world with the insider knowledge and experience necessary to lead that resistance against the Russell sub-satanic occupation and anti-godly insurgency. So again, go to DouglasDietrich.com and click Donate. The very survival of the human species be at stake, and I am not exaggerating. Do not wait. Donate now. It be appreciated beyond my ability to express in any language. And subscribe to the Douglas Dietrich YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Douglas Dietrich. And tap, click that notification bell in order to receive notifications that live streams has started. My gratitude unto the all who grace myself support. Most blessed be thyselves and all thine own. And our acknowledgments go to Stephen Myers, who sent us uh, half a hundred dollars, to Elizabeth Chaplin, God bless you, honey, who sent us a quarter of a hundred dollars, Pacon Mireles, or Pacwani Mireles, uh, uh, another quarter of a hundred dollars, and Ben Archibald, uh, another quarter of a hundred dollars, and Wilhelmus Buse, Buse, uh, another uh, quarter of a hundred dollars from me, and shout outs unto Derek Talley and Patrick Weaver. We shall arrange as soon as we can for an appearance where I will be speaking with both of them, 
And Stephen Myers again made suggestion that I speak to some African American uh, interviewers about uh, uh, Black African American history, and of course, uh, I would always recommend Peter Moon uh, for future interviews in that regard as well, with his specialization in Moorish history. And uh, to the young lady named my fetish story, um, she is someone who leaves a wonderful commentary under the YouTube videos. She asked about the Eye of Horus. Uh, that she asked about how. It came to be perceived as evil. Peter Moon can help me answer that because the person who made it become perceived as evil was Trevor Ravenscroft, who was exploiting Aleister Crowley or the legacy of Aleister Crowley and poisoned the world against the mythical figure of Horus uh, most unnecessarily and uh, malignly. Um, so we'll go a bit into that as we... Uh, continue with our conversation. Now, one of the things I did, Peter, was I uh, spracketh to people about Coast to Coast AM and, of course, uh, their chain of command going all the way to Michael Aquino. Uh, I mentioned the involvement, of course, of uh, Rear Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, who was a former uh, Federal uh, Reserve Chairman uh, for the branch of Texas and a uh, man still in consultation with the United States Navy and most of his work was in intelligence. The majority of his resume is classified from any public review. And uh, he, of course, was the commander for uh, George Norrie when George Norrie was a spin doctor, a public relations officer for the United States Navy for 10 years. And, of course, he, George Noy still works for the same boss, uh, Rear Admiral Inman, who uh, owns Clear Channel. And Clear Channel, of course, owns Premier Radio Network, uh, which is in turn owned by uh, Billy Joe Red McCombs, one of the richest men in the world, who was one of the major shareholders and co-owners of Blackwater Mercenary Corporation. And uh, so here you've got all these assholes in a chain of command from the top down. And uh, really, uh, one of the ways to get on Coast to Coast AM is to have affiliation with Michael Aquino. That's how James Casbolt slash Michael Prince got on. Uh, that's how I got on was because I impressed uh, George Norrie with all my insider knowledge as being someone who was literally an Aquino cultist, misleading him in that regard, having never been one. And uh, of course, my liaison with Michael Aquino gave me far more in-depth knowledge than even an actual cultist like James Casbolt slash Michael Prince would have. So with all that in mind, just the sheer sewer of shit that Coast to Coast AM is, what were they trying to do to despoil the waters, which are essentially your swimming pool? These are, these are your waters, your territory, uh, your, your ground, so to speak. And uh, they brought on um, some CAD uh, to confuse the issue to muddy the waters tell us a bit about all that and clarify things for us and take your time okay so i had received a phone call uh yesterday from a a old friend of mine who was a uh, who's an attorney mm -hmm. and a geophysicist who worked at uh with or at brookhaven national laboratory and he's been a, a fan of my work for, for many, many years. And he said that uh, he called me up to tell me that on Coast to Coast, uh, I guess it would have been three nights ago or maybe two nights ago, whenever it was the night after he called me, there was, uh, he said it was coming out of WOR in Toronto and it was Richard Sirrett, uh, Sirrett, which is similar in sounding but different in spelling than Mary Surratt, hmm. uh, who was the uh, who was actually hung for conspiring to kill Abraham Lincoln. Good uh, Lord. She, she, I mean, I, I'm not saying that the two are related. The names are similar. Right. Um, and anyway, he spells his name with a Y S Y. She was an S U. And anyway, he's. Um, I, I know nothing about the man except that he has a a show out of, and he's, you know, Canadian, and he, he broadcasts out of Toronto. Now, what I was told was that he, the, uh, the, the man that you were alluding to who he had on was a man named Christopher Garitano. And Christopher Garitano is the uh, uh, producer uh, and creator of a, of a documentary called The Montauk Chronicles. Mm -hmm. Now, Christopher Garitano had... Um, 
many, many years ago. He, I mean, it, I think he started a, a little after 2000, and he was trying to raise money to do a documentary. Mm -hmm. And he, on Montauk, and, and I was alerted to his website, and he's using the book, he's promoting the book, and saying he's doing this documentary. And uh, he was, uh, the star of the movie was a guy named John Brody. Not the football player, but a guy named John Brody, and he was going into John Brody's experience with Montauk, and it looked like they were co-opting the whole Montauk story, and they were promoting it. And I, I, you know, kindly wrote to John Brody because I didn't know who was producing it, uh, and I, I wrote to John Brody, who was actually a customer of mine, uh, seemed to be a very nice guy, and I, I wrote him a, a very polite. Uh, cease and desist email mm -hmm. to stop using the book, the Montauk project, you know, I mean, cause it's like, it's not yours to use. And he called me back and just was, uh, you know, what, what is it, effusively apologetic and says, I'm sorry, I didn't know you needed doesn't some, some people are naive and they don't know how, you know, uh, copyright laws work. And he, he was, so anyway, uh, and Stuart Swerdlow was involved in this production as well. Now, uh, 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 by the way, ignorance of the law is no excuse, and Stuart Swerdlow's involvement makes it quite suspect <laughs> that he Stuart well, Swerdlow well, knows you. Yeah, and, Stuart's you know. Stuart's uh, involvement, you know, becomes very significant. I'll go on the story, but what, this is sort of the background, right. and. So anyway, okay, so John, it's fine, you know, and he apologized, and okay, you know, that's that. Just don't use it without permission. And then uh, about 15 minutes later, I get this very aggressive, nasty call from Christopher Garitano. He says, why are you trying, what are you calling my guy and hassling my, you know, it's like, it's like well, no, excuse me. I said, I, I didn't call, called me. I just sent him a polite cease and desist. And this guy was very, oh, you can't do it. You know, and like he, he thinks he's entitled to do a story on this. And he's not. So he was basically, you know, got cease and desist letter from me. Mm -hmm. And then he, um, he went out to Montauk. Well, I, I, he didn't go out to Montauk. Well, he did go out to Montauk. So anyway, I mean, this took like years and years and years for him to do. He was very underfunded. He was very, but he persisted. He persisted and uh, apparently worked very hard. And he did a, uh, so anyway, okay, so my Bulgarian friends were visiting me. Uh, and this was probably, God, I don't know when it was. Uh, but they, it was probably about 2013 or something like that, as I recall. And they wanted to go to Montauk. So I remember, and they wanted to meet Duncan. So I took him to meet Duncan. And then we went out to Montauk, which they enjoyed meeting Duncan. And he enjoyed meeting them. And we went out to Montauk. And I know Duncan didn't want to be in that movie. He didn't want to have anything to do with him. And then we went... So, so we're out at Montauk, we're at the base, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, there's Preston Nichols. Last time I ever saw him on Long Island, Preston, what the hell are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Oh, he's, he's, you know, they brought him, uh, they drove him down here because they're going to have a premiere of this movie, The Montauk Chronicles. I said, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, so uh, I think we might have already found out about it. And, and anyway, so... So he's Preston, so Preston's going to go, well, why don't, okay. So we were walking around the base and then we went, we, uh, so we went, it was at Gurney's Inn, which is a kind of a famous place out at Montauk that used to be owned by the mob, I, our mobs, uh, connected people. I don't know if it still is, but in any case, we, you know, said, okay, we'll go to dinner with Preston. So we went to Gurney's and where they were going to have the movie. And uh, they were going to try and, you know, somebody was supposed to let us in for free. Mm -hmm. It was about 30 bucks or something. And um, I certainly didn't want my friends to have to pay. And, and so. <laughs> yes, 30 bucks. Yeah, let's, go on. Yeah. It was a special event. You know, it was a premiere. And so it was, a, you know, I had at least 100 people there. And 
and so anyway, it was really funny. Um, what happened was they nobody made the arrangements to get us in for free. Oh, shit. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden it was like it was like this gateway opened up. Oh, We're gosh. out there and the person at the desk kind of turned their back. Uh-huh. And and one of my friends on the end, she, she that was from Montauk and her and her mother were just completely outraged by this production. They thought this guy's really off his rocker. What does he think he's doing? You know, uh, trying to steal the, the property or whatever. Mm-hmm. That was their point. And she just kind of like motions us and come on in. It was like the Red Sea part. So we all came in, you know, we all got in for free. Yeah. It, it, it was kind of like, you know, I, could, I suppose you could say we snuck in. Right. But we just walked in, just breezed right in. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, because nobody really thought, that, you know, you should pay to go to this. Thing. <laughs> and then, you know, so anyway, uh, the story, the, the documentary was, it kind of started off okay. Mm-hmm. It was interviewing, uh, Stuart held up well in the interview. He did a good job. He actually did a good job. I uh, I don't remember if it was Preston or Al B. Al Bielik was interviewed, and Al, of course, Al is on his like his last legs, and he, he you know, he's not at his at his best. Uh, but I, I remember being sort of interested in it, or could hold my interest. None of this stuff is too interesting to me anymore. But for about forty five minutes, forty five minutes, and then it fell apart. It completely fell apart, and then it was. Um, and then they had Preston talking about, you know, aliens drinking Drano, this alien reptilian would drink Drano. And this is a story Preston would tell. And I'd always, t- I said, Preston, don't talk about this stuff. Because even if it's true, it doesn't do anything for your credibility. And spraying gray, I don't know if he did it in, in this movie, but he used to talk about spraying grays with Lysol because they stunk so bad. And... He would tell these stories, which might have been true or they might not have been true, but they certainly were in his consciousness true. And they just, you know, he would shoot bullets in his feet because he didn't understand credibility in terms of a public relations reference frame. He just didn't understand it because it wasn't in his reference frame. Uh, he was in his own world. And so anyway, uh, this, the whole story sort of fell apart. And after it finished, my my two Bulgarian friends who speak English very well, you know, you know, my the female shook her head and, and the male just says, shit, shit. You know, they didn't like it. Right. So anyway, uh, that actually he changed it. Now, now he had copyright violations in there mm-hmm. and uh, they were. He showed the book and, you know, when he'd show the book. He showed the Montauk Project by Preston Nichols, and then he wouldn't show the Peter Moon name. Of course not. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's necessarily funny. I mean, that doesn't offend me. It's like, and I, he actually asked me, when, when he called me on the phone, he says, well, actually, I meant to, to call you. We hadn't got around to calling you. We wanted to include you. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't want to be in your, in your production. You know, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this guy. I mean, he's, he's really lowbrow, in my opinion. And, and... Uh, and anybody who acts that way is just, you know, you, you, you know, just, just complete, uh, you know, uh, not a ethical person. Right. So anyway, uh, he, he was pandering to the lowest common denominator. So then he put out another one, mm-hmm. which actually kind of ignited the whole Stranger Things phenomenon, ah. uh, because. The, the guy saw it, and they they used the they. I could have sued both of these people, and I could have done it effectively, but it's like uh, I didn't. You know, it's not worth my time and energy. You know, it's not worth the time and energy. And uh, what's interesting? Okay, so this is sort of the history of this. Now, what eventually happened is in two thousand. What's, what's this year? This is 2019. 19. Yeah. So it would have been in 2018. I was uh, contacted by somebody who was doing a production with the History Channel. 
and he was going to do a documentary on the Montauk Project. Uh, would I like to participate? Bloody bloody blah. blah, blah. <laughs> so I, I, uh, one of my uh, psychic friends said, she says, who I consult with every month. She says, do it. It's going to be good for you. Do it. Okay. So what I basically did was I spent, um, they picked me up in a limo, took me out to Montauk. I only spent about four or five, four hours or five hours out there. And I, I, I was paid for it, which of course I insisted upon. And <laughs> they, they took me back and they interviewed me for two hours, talked all about Dr. David Anderson, talked all about, you know, I even showed them where specific underground tunnels were, introduced them to my friend, Joe Lafreno, who's a professional actor. He's been, and he actually works as a, as a, uh, not a ranger, but a, uh, a park, park, I don't know if they call him park, it's not park policeman, but he's, you know, he's an official at the Montauk Air Force Station mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, does maintenance and stuff, in addition to being a, uh, an actor. Wow. Um, and so some kind of park ranger cue. <laughs> get what his title is, you know, park. I don't, he's not park police. He's not. He's kind of a kind of a ranger, I guess. And and Joe is he has had, uh, you know, he's been a friend of mine since 1993. And he's had experiences as a so-called Montauk boy. And uh, he was deprogrammed by Preston. And uh, that, that was a whole nother story. So, I, you know, we talked about that. And anyway, they didn't, sh when they did the two hours show, mm -hmm. but see what they got was they got me to sign a release to use the book right? because uh, I'm the publisher. So yeah, I signed the release, but not until I got the wording right because they basically gave me a release form that basically gave them the rights to everything. Of course, I mean, that's what they and, wanted. And, and yeah. So what I did was... Uh, you know, I changed it. I, you know, said, well, you got to change this. You got to do this. And, and the lawyer got back to me and says, no, this is not acceptable. Blah, 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 blah. No, it's going to be that, you know, and it's like, this guy's nuts. So I wrote to the producer and he said, he was very diplomatic. And he says, he says, there's always something. And he made him change it to exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Because if he didn't do it, he wouldn't get the, he wouldn't get it. Right. And so, you know, he, he was, but I mean, just the asininity of some, you know, <laughs> this is just like Amazon sending me a, a, a notice saying you are selling an ebook that is public domain information. Yeah. You know, like they didn't say, how dare you, but they might as well. How dare you? And you're not going to be able to do this and that, another. And I sent them a copy of the copyright. Right. You know, um, and they shut up, you know, <laughs> you know. It, it, so anyway, they're saying, you know, this is an urban legend. So, uh, I mean, that had to be an Aquino acolyte who, who was up to that to, to acquire acquire the copyright. Right. right. Um, which I am renewing, you know, next year because it's 28 years that, you know, it's time to renew the copyright. Right. So anyway, um, they um, here, here we go. Uh, OK, so anyway, uh you know, they, they had me on camera for, you know, at least two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then it, it came time to show, to, to do the show. It was called The Dark Files. And they were planning to do, Montauk was their lead show. Then they were going to do Dulce, uh, New Mexico, and all that sort of stuff. And then Area 51, they had big plans. Mm -hmm. And... I watched the show with, with my wife. My daughter was watching it with her boyfriend mm -hmm. uh, in, in another location. And uh, we kept waiting to see if they were going to have me on. They never did have me on. They didn't <laughs> change my name. And, and now that was fair play. They, did, they said they might not use the footage. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they ended up doing... Then I found out that Christopher Garitano was involved in, in the production. He was not the producer but they had a whole segment with him which was very poorly done people complained about it but it sold a lot of books it even caused uh the daily mail 
in UK to pick it up. So it like kind of really boosted the book sales, mm -hmm. which was great, very much needed at the time. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my psychic friend was right. She says, it will benefit you to do it because I gave them permission to use it. Omitting me was actually made me feel good because I didn't want to be a part of that production when it, when I, after I saw it. <laughs> and, and it was so stupid. And, and this was also very cute. They, they interviewed Timothy Leary's son. Uh, and they said, you know, well, and they, they did a whole segment on Timothy Leary at Montauk. And uh, what well, well, Timothy Leary was supposed to be at Montauk, and they showed the LSD rooms. Uh, there were LSD rooms, they, we called them, because Preston had taken footage. And they got some other footage, I think, uh, of, of the LSD rooms. Uh, which are just these psychedelic rooms on an Air Force base. What the hell were these, you know, doing there? Uh, so Timothy Leary, and so so they said, well, they interviewed his son. Well, I, you know, he's basically saying, no, Timothy Leary, well, how the hell would he know? You know, he was his son. <laughs> it, you know, it wasn't like Tim was at home all the time doing Little League. <laughs> and I, I can tell some more Timothy Leary story in a second here, but because uh, I actually met him and gave him a copy of the book. Uh, oh. but mm -hmm. anyway, um, the, so the whole Timothy Leary story got started, uh, when Preston and I were in the Montauk Downs, which is where the state park office was for the, the Camp Hero station. And we went in there because I think Preston wanted to get a fishing license so that he would have an ostensible legal reason to be on the base at a certain time. Hmm. And it, he didn't want to fish. And right, right. he was rather uh, awkward in the way he approached these guys. I mean, it was kind of like, I think he even talked to the superintendent and they were kind of, you know, like, you know, what the hell are you doing? What do you want? But there was a very nice woman at the receptionist and she's probably passed away now. Never would say her name before, Winnie McKinney. Mm -hmm. And she was very nice and she says, Oh, well, should we told her, I don't know if we told her who we were, but we basically were talking about uh, Montauk Air Force Station. And she said, oh, yeah, weird stuff out there. It scrambles the TV all the time. And she says, you know, I was out there as as, as a young person. We used to go out on the bluffs uh, by the lighthouse and we'd have picnics and we look out and see all these Nazi U-boats out there. They'd come up with their periscopes every time at a certain day. Yeah, we knew them. They were all out there. It, this, and, this was during... The war or after? Yes. yes, during the war. Oh, during the war. Okay, yes. Yeah, you see, uh, I can. There's some more Nazi stuff. Is I, I begin. I, I don't know if whether I think it's the pyramids of Montauk book, right? Uh, where there is a digging, a New York State authorized, sponsored dig right. of the Montauk Air Force Station looking for Nazi gold. They're digging up the Air Force Station looking for gold because there've been so many rumors and so many stories, and yes, indeed. Uh, there was the Nazis were very chummy during that period at Montauk mm -hmm. and how chummy we can't really say uh, Steven Spielberg did a movie about these four Nazis coming ashore uh, and, and it was all misdirection because yeah. there were uh, there were a lot of instances of Nazis coming ashore just like Japan Japanese coming ashore in, in on the West Coast there were right. Nazis coming ashore on Long Island, and their very story. Some woman on the North Shore of Long Island told me about some Nazi running through their yard or something and, and trying to escape the authorities. Uh -huh. uh, so, in, in any case, she told us that you know the U-boats would come out there and just you know you know up periscope or whatever. I right. guess because they got come up shore now and then, and uh, so. Well, just to yeah. put some of that in perspective, what uh, people need to realize is that uh, Peter Moon brings up an uh, important point. This is, of course, my territory. We don't need to go into this in depth right now, but just as a very small kind of debriefing in that regard, uh, uh, Paul Higgins, or um, oh gosh, uh, he wrote the book Trading with the Enemy, which uh, outlines it uh, very well. And Trading with the Enemy is almost required reading for anyone who um, wants to understand a bit more uh, about the world around them. It would probably, Charles Higham was the individual's name, and uh, surname spelled H-I-G-H-A-M. And uh, the subtitle is The Nazi American Money Plot, 
1933 through 1949. Now, that's a very important uh, set of dates there. Instead of ending in 1945, uh, he uh, points out 1949. And in the book Trading with the Enemy, uh, that, of course, is named after the Trading with the Enemy Act, which is a stock short title used for legislation in the United Kingdom and the United States relating uh, to trading with the enemy in wartime. So the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, or the TWEA, as I remember as a federal bureaucrat for the Department of Defense, is the United States federal law enacted on October 6, 1917 in World War I, that gives the president executive power to oversee uh, trade uh, during wartime. And uh, yet during World War II, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had no control over the fact that U-boats were uh, coming ashore in the United States and basically uh, doing whatever they were doing, which of course we can only speculate uh, with uh, various people that they were doing business with. And so, so business continues even during wartime because business is business. And uh, one of the um, things that uh, they did after the war uh, to just cover this up from the American public was uh, just as Mr. Moon was pointing out, you have Japanese on the West Coast and uh, Germans on the uh, Atlantic seaboard, as well as Italians and uh, likely some Romanians as well. Uh, the third largest Axis power in Europe, uh, etc. You have this need uh, after the war for them to deny all of this. So basically, if you try and go into any conventional history books, uh, all you're going to find is just pure, raw bullshit. It's just, just crap like, oh, there was only one landing party of about nine men uh, or eight men, about eight men that got off a of U-boat and they were, uh, you know, and then they were captured and they were executed as spies. And and this is like uh, the, the idea that the Americans are trying to present is that uh, no Axis personnel landed on America's shores, that America's shores were inviolable, that, that, that America be inviolate. Uh, this is all part of the indoctrination, the programming. Oh, Japanese balloon bombs uh, never landed. And when they did land, no damage was done, etc. It, all of this is just pure, raw bullshit. So, um, of course, the witnesses at that time, uh, like um, Peter Moon was pointing out, and uh, the lovely um, elderly lady who um, he named her because she's likely no longer with us, uh, were eyewitness to this. And um, so it's amazing she didn't panic and it's amazing her indoctrination didn't drive her to like, um, you know, run away screaming because she saw the Nazi U-boats. Uh, so have to but, admire you know, her. Some people, you take things in stride yeah. and, and you just kind of laugh. It's like, uh, you know, if, if you're living on a on a corner yeah. where you see the mobsters all the time and they know who you are and you know who they are and you don't bother them and they don't bother you. Yeah, it's just kind of like okay, another one went down the, you know, bit the dust. Right. You know, as long as you don't bother them, it's sort of like that. That's sort of an attitude, and as they say, uh, and, and Montauk is just plain weird, right. uh, and uh, a, a place that might compete for weirdness in your neck of the woods is Mill Valley, uh, right. a place that's completely shrink ridden. Uh, <laughs> <and, laughs> yes. No, in fact, you know, to digress for when I was. In San Francisco, I think it's 2006. Uh, me and my daughter were looking for we were looking for directions. We stopped to, and we were looking because my I had a friend in Mill Valley we were going to stay with, and I I saw this we stopped this woman on the street, and she you know looked pretty pretty coherent, pretty nice, and I said you know we're 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 looking uh, you know can you can you give us some directions? We're looking for such and such, and she goes oh she says. I'm I'm from uh, San Francisco. I, I don't know my way around here. And uh, I said, God, this place is weird. She says, Yeah, it sure is. You know, she totally agreed with me. I mean, she saw that this this place was weird. Just a lot of not only a lot of shrinks, but a lot of all of Marin County is full of shrinks. Mm -hmm. And and these were also shrink uh, patients. Right. right. And uh, Stinson Beach. You know, was was also weird. But by the uh, way, if you've for, ever been there. For, for for our for our younger uh, listeners, they may not be too familiar with the term shrink. Uh, what Mister Moon is referring to is, of course, uh, psychiatrists. And uh, in in all fairness, total disclosure here. 
uh, is Scientology, and and there's there's legitimate reason for this. Scientology, of course, has always been antithetical to psychiatry, or or at least it became such. I I, I think that uh, um, it always was from okay. day one. It okay. was an alternative to psychiatry, and in those days. In the early 50s, they were using ice picks, lobotomies. Oh, and yes, that's shot. right. You, no, he's and, right. And so, yeah, yeah. Everything Mr. Moon is has just mentioned, just to clarify for people the horror of this, um, psychiatry is fraught with atrocity, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, I, of course, emphasized in the past that some of the worst places in the United States were just uh, horror uh chambers of horror, uh, like you had in Oregon and Washington state where you had, uh, psychiatric facilities where they had actual incinerators for human flesh. And, uh, one of the things that happened with the, uh, Washington, uh, state hospital, uh, for the insane was that, um, they had literally thousands of cans of human ash, uh, including, uh, cans that were labeled, uh, human infant male. Uh, where, you know, basically the screws, as they called them, which, you know, like shrink, screw is a, a derogatory term. Shrink refers to a professional psychiatrist because it comes from the term head shrinker. Screw refers to the guards at um, psychiatric facilities. And the reason they called them screws is because they spent so much time screwing uh, the patients, are literally fucking the patients, sodomizing the male patients, having uh, straight sex with the female patients. And these female patients would often become pregnant. And at places that they had the convenient human incinerators at uh, to dispose of the bodies of all the people they murdered and hide all the evidence, just hide any evidence of the fact they were beaten to death. They threw them in the incinerator. And uh, for the um, uh, ladies who uh, were pregnant, they just let them carry the baby to term. They didn't even bother to abort it because that would cost money and take effort. So they just let it, the, the woman carry the baby till the point where it was delivered and then they threw it into the incinerator. Uh, and uh, so you had these ash cans that were exposing that. Uh, many people, of course, they used pickaxes to lobotomize them, literally took ice picks and just uh, drove it into the temples of the, of the uh, skull to uh, uh, just rearrange, literally physically scramble uh, the brain. Uh, so in response to this, in all fairness, uh, Mr. L. Ron Hubbard uh, developed Dianetics. And uh, then when he had trademark uh, issues with that, or uh, copyright issues, he, he uh, developed uh, the Church of Scientology. Uh, and, and, and Peter Moon could tell us who he had those issues with, the, the copyright or the trade, uh, probably some other science fiction writer like A.E. Van Voigt, I would think, who ultimately... No, 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 no. That was uh, actually... Uh, Dianetics was out of his hands for a period of time, uh -huh. uh, and, and that caused him to... It gave him good reason to go in another direction, and, and then uh, he got he got the copyrights back. Okay, uh, legally he got them back, mm -hmm. um, and uh, because Dianetics the book, yeah, the, the book is so was, much. Was, there yeah. was a distinguishing actually. Mm -hmm. He there was a legitimate reason for the two subjects. Mm -hmm. Dianetics dealt with the body. Mm -hmm. It dealt with psychosomatic issues of the body. Uh, Scientology was dealt with the spirit. And that there were two different uh, components. Okay, hence, hence the name Church for Scientology, right? That makes sense. So, what? Uh, by the way, we're not promoting Scientology here. <laughs> we're just trying to articulate the uh, the the context of uh, what was going on with that. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously, uh, this is a field that's always fascinating to study. And uh, the one thing I want to point out before I forget it, and uh, it's one of the things that uh, obviously it it, it just it drives me mad when I think of how ignorant people are and the kind of stupid, snap, reflexive judgments that they make uh, based on the crap that they're fed. Uh, and one of those things has to do with, say, for instance, a person's background. Obviously, I deal with this because of the background that I have. Having worked with the federal government, having been involved in espionage, there's a point to be made here about people with an espionage background. People like us we have very malleable, almost uh, permeable resumes that are easily rewritten. They're easily revised because everything we've done is basically destroyed 
and there's no documentation to prove what we are. This is the insanity that people have when they don't understand just how fucked up it is to be a spy. And so when you deal with people who come out of this kind of background and they have an enormous amount of talents that enable to, them to do things that normal people cannot do, the majority of them are former spies. Both Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini were members of the intelligence community. Adolf Hitler was uh, working for the Reichswehr or the Reich's uh, uh, interregnum, the in between uh, the Kaiser and in between the Third Reich. There was what was called the Weimar Republic. That was not its official name. Uh, but uh, within that uh, transitional democracy of Germany, uh, what you had was the military branch known as the Reichswehr or the Reichsforce which employed Adolf Hitler as an unemployed veteran to spy on other veterans. So he had this intelligence background. Benito Mussolini actually worked for British intelligence. He actually started as somebody who was working for British intelligence and journalism. And so when people take a look at, well, how do these men know about the inside workings of government? How do they get so, uh, so astute, so uh, able? I mean, these are men literally off the street. How did they get to the point where they could rise to the top of power like that? They're basically rogue assets or renegade agents. Uh, which is why I use the term renegade uh, as a military historian, with our man uh, L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard was sheep-dipped in terms of his records. He obviously had an intelligence background. And you can tell this because he organized his own intelligence unit for Scientology, the Guardian Office, the GO. So Peter Moon worked with the Sea Org, the Sea Organization, which was the private maritime militia of L. Ron Hubbard, which actually purchased decommissioned warships. And he was fielding his own James Bond level private Navy. The fact that he had to protect these assets uh, prompted him to develop the GO, the Guardian Office. So he had his own intelligence network. Now, no fucking science fiction writer has the organizational capability where they just say, oh, I'd like to do this. And they just snap their fingers and they do something like that. He came from a background that enabled him to do this professionally. So uh, when you are confronted by people who think L. Ron Hubbard was just some fucking science fiction writer <laughs> and then just suddenly came up and say, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just start a church. I mean, uh, obviously, this is not how it works. And um, the one reason he was able to write Dianetics and, uh, was because he had been uh, employed by the United States government during the Korean War to try and frame the Soviets by writing a textbook on brainwashing that they could present to the United Nations and say, see, we've captured a Soviet uh, textbook on brainwashing or the manual, the brainwashing manual. He actually wrote that. He actually participated in the translation of that into the Russian. And uh, other translators worked with him, of course. But uh, this is the level at which L. Ron Hubbard worked. Much of it was then later hidden, as testified by Fletcher Prouty, and, uh, who was one of the men who was contracted by Scientology to dig into L. Ron Hubbard's background because so much was being brought up to try and discredit him about his time in the Navy. Uh, in other words, they were doing with L. Ron Hubbard. And in this sense, I can very much relate to him, what they try to do to me. In other words, claim he wasn't there. And L. Ron Hubbard had command of two ships in secession. And yet they, this is how he knew how to organize his own fucking Navy was because he was in command of two warships during wartime. So, you know, to, to try and hide that, the U.S. government claimed he was never there. He was a coward. He was uh, uh, just the side of being a deserter. And, uh, and they, these are experts at document alteration, document destruction. I mean, I destroyed documents and altered them myself. So um, one thing that I can guarantee is that he was one of the psychological observation officers at the various nuclear tests where he himself contracted radiation cancer that ultimately killed him. And this was a big part of uh, a tumor which was growing in his brain, which caused him to behave more and more radically uh, violently uh, and antisocially as he got older and was part of the tragedy of, of his life. So uh, it, it, Peter Moon can probably add much more depth to what I'm describing, but uh, it provides some context 
uh, for what he's talking about with the kind of antipathy that L. Ron Hubbard felt towards psychiatry, um, much of the abuses and the damages that were being carried out by that profession, uh, which had almost total control over people's lives once you were turned into a psychiatrist's care at that point in history, and the kind of facilities people wound up in, they lost total control of their own lives, and many of them would lose their lives. And a lot of this had to do with private property, because if people got the heir to an estate uh, to be declared insane, they would just have everything, of course, signed over to them, or they could be declared the care provider and therefore steal the estate from usually wives or daughters that would inherit uh, estate property, that sort of thing. So L. Ron Hubbard was trying to provide an alternative to that. So when you try to look at it from the most positive perspective, the man had a mission, and, um, and that mission has been terribly derailed. <laughs> Yes, back, back to the context, I was, you know, comparing uh, Mill Valley and Stinson Beach to, uh, to Montauk. Yeah. Uh, Montauk is not known for having uh, shrinks in and around it. I mean, you know, uh, you have a disproportionate amount of psychiatrists in Marin County, which is the county just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Right. And in, uh, in California. Yeah. And you have Mill Valley and, and also San Rafael with a high concentration in Sausalito, very beautiful uh, little town. But by the way, these are stuff. all some of the wealthiest areas in the United States. And uh, yes, so. and wealthy people can afford psychiatry. Yes. And one thing about psychiatry is there is no, uh, like what you would call, like you see a lot of people enthusiastic and wild about Oprah Winfrey. You see a lot of <laughs> People wild and enthusiastic about Art Bell and Coast to Coast. Yes, it's all right. Uh, or even Alex Jones or Donald Trump. Yes. But the thing is, you don't see a lot of people wild and enthusiastic about psychiatry. They're, they're not. Uh, and, and it's because most of the people that go to psychiatry, if not all of them, have serious problems. And uh, sometimes their problems get worse. So you're, and, and sometimes, uh, the psychiatrist can make them worse, as Douglas was uh, alluding to previously. So what I'm saying is if you have a, and I'm just saying is you see these people in in the towns of Mill Valley, and, and these are very yeah, wealthy towns, and uh, Stinson Beach, it's like they're like Stepford Wives is a good context, and yes. Montauk's the same, where there's something going on, and it, whether it's it's psychiatry induced or not is beside the point. You see these people walking around acting in a very strange way. So uh, anyway, back to this woman, she said that Timothy Leary was out there uh, on the base giving out tabs of LSD. Uh, he was out there. Now, this would probably be in the 60s, right. the late 60s. And because Leary didn't last long into the 70s, That's he true. got to- He had this very short arc of fame. So, well, so. he got, he got, uh, he was, uh, it's had to escape uh, to Algiers. And uh, Country Joe McDonald of Country Joe and the Fish even wrote a song about it, uh, about him escaping to, you know, from uh, Oakland to New York and New York to Algiers uh, via Marseille. And, and, and he, uh, and, and of course, there he was looks, uh, sought out the protection of Eldridge Cleaver. And Eldridge Cleaver, uh, who was, uh, you know, uh, very much involved with the Black Panthers was an expatriate himself. He had to escape mm -hmm. because the police were coming after him. Mm -hmm. And what Eldridge Cleaver did with Timothy Leary mm -hmm. uh, is, you know, he first, uh, he basically locked him up and treated him as a, a prisoner because, you know, Timothy Leary was white. He was the enemy. And, <laughs> and, and <laughs> Timothy Leary saying, look at, no, I'm on your side. You don't understand. And uh, Eldridge Cleaver didn't care. Well, you know, Eldridge uh, Cleaver had every right to be suspect because it was later exposed that Timothy Leary was working for the CIA and passing out all those acid tabs. It was all part of that uh, CIA experiment with uh, destroying people's lives 
Uh, and, and so Timothy Leary was the enemy and Eld Eldridge Cleaver uh, probably felt he had been uh, basically assigned to take down Eldridge Cleaver. So he, 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 I could see exactly why he felt that way. I mean, we, we always have to be cautious in the situations that we're in, of course. But by the way, before I forget, you were talking about that, that fool who said he had caged the beast at Montauk. Uh, was he yes. referencing what I have come to understand as the so-called Montauk monster, the kind of energy. No, no, no. Okay. The Montauk monster is different. I'm not talking uh, about the, what the, what washed up on the beach. I'm no, sorry. no, 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 no. They didn't. They never. They never called the beast. The, okay. They never called him the Montauk monster. They called him Junior, mm -hmm. or the beast. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, th this was uh, supposedly a character that was concocted out of Duncan Cameron's mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, uh, you know, amplified out of the etheric plane to manifest in the physical plane and uh, not only scare the living daylights out of people, but to wreak uh, destruction and and, uh, and literally tear the place apart. This, this is what the beast was, hmm. you know. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. That, that So anyway, Timothy Leary, uh, you know, it was just basically this one's woman test. That's how this whole idea of Timothy Leary being met in Montauk even occurred. It's just, a, it's an anecdote. It's a story. There's no, uh, I guess, nothing rides on it. There's no, it's not important. It's, it's interesting. There were psychedelic rooms painted out there. He could have been involved with them or not, but it's not worth taking 20 minutes of, of uh, airtime for because it's, you know, I mean, Timothy Leary is a, is a compelling figure historically. Now, another thing, the other anecdote about Timothy Leary, it was 19... 93 uh, mm -hmm. uh and i was uh, i had this very flamboyant interesting uh friend at the time who had told me she was brazilian and she told me to go to this festival in uh the extreme western end of new york called Sh sherman is the name of the town uh the brushwood folk festival or whatever it, but it was it was a group called starwood i think they still meet in ohio uh and it was basically a pagan festival and she said i want you to go there and meet robert anton wilson he was he's going to be there he was there last year and uh so she reserved some rooms and i reserve i don't know if she reserved a room for me or not but anyway because i was researching wilson's the name wilson was a big part of my research so um, I was going there to meet Robert Anton Wilson. Mm -hmm. Well, Robert Anton Wilson was not even scheduled to be there. Instead, it was his good friend, Timothy Leary. Mm -hmm. So I went to meet the Wilson and I got Timothy Leary. <laughs> and I tell you, he gave, his lectures were impeccable. They followed the whole uh, pattern of a, of a university professor he lectured impeccably well, he had an his, academic background i well i know that <laughs> thesis antithesis i mean it was I, you don't hear pro professors in academic backgrounds don't lecture like that they're not that good okay good they're point not, yeah they're they're not, point well taken don't do that anymore. <laughs> he was he was a classical phd and he, he was impeccable and of course he's everything he's saying is totally antithetical to what they teach in universities Right. And, in, and in this respect, he was very good. And um, I don't know if I approached him then what I remember. And this is a very amusing story. I uh, go and, and they're taking a photograph of him. And they're doing a photo op. And there's like all these like naked women. It's like a, it's about 12 of them. And they're surrounding and they're getting him in this shot. And he's right in the middle. And they're going to take this picture of him. And there's this, this overweight guy who, who's kind of dressed like King Neptune. And he's, he's like crying. He's practically crying. And he, he reminds me of the character, if you've ever seen the TV show Seinfeld, of, of the character Newman, the overweight postman. And he's, he's like, he's sitting there. And I go, I go what's, what's wrong with you? What's wrong? And he goes, he goes, they don't want me to photo. He says, I'm too fat. And I said, you can be in the photo. I said, you can be in the photo. Don't, no, no. You can be in the photo. And I just kind of, I kind of pushed him over there and 
Next thing I turned around, he was right in the middle of the photo with mom. It was, it was pretty cool. Uh, you know, I, I, I did something for, I, I gave him some confidence there. Uh, and he fit in, he fit in perfectly. So then, anyway, I gave him, <laughs> I, I, after that, I gave Timothy Leary the book. Uh-huh. And he says, oh, sign it, please. And uh, and then I, I saw him later, uh-huh. you know, in the evening. And, and he says, which, uh, which book says, did you give him? The Montauk Project. That was the only book I had at the time, oh, you know, okay. uh, that, that book you know, really started my publishing company because that's what that's all that was the first one. Okay. And, and he said, uh, he says, oh, this, this, this is fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. He says, he says, yeah, I want to I want to I want to stay in touch. And uh, uh, I, I don't remember. He must have given me his I don't know if he gave me his card or what. I don't even remember. Uh, but um, OK, so that was that he was very interested. And then it was probably six months later. Preston Nichols was doing an event in Sacramento uh, and Timothy Leary was also on the bill. So I called the organizer of the event to arrange to meet for the two of them to meet. And Preston told me, I said, did you meet him? He says, no. He says, uh, the organizer talked to me and, and, uh, talked to him and, and she said he didn't want to have any he says he, he's when she she suggested the meeting he says he says i don't want to have anything to do with preston nichols like he was afraid of him he was afraid of Preston nichols because he recognized him as a as a spoke mm-hmm. who could outspoke him uh so <laughs> you know that, that that was kind of uh he, he wasn't with the program let me say that as far as uh offering any help or whatnot but anyway back to this this documentary uh, Timothy Leary was, you know, it's like nothing to do with anything, well, you know. Beyond that, aside from the um, just bringing up this uh, kind of, uh, I, I understand you're bringing up positive aspects of Timothy Leary, and that's appreciated. Uh, uh, but of course, he's he's basically kind of like a, a washout who kind of, as as far as the rest of the, my generation or generations after are concerned was kind of like a one trick pony. I mean, the only thing people will ever remember him for is uh, drop out, you know, uh, tune in and turn on just the kind of, uh, uh, you know, let's do drugs. And uh, it, it, well, it was, you know, that's but, the media. That's what the media did turned to him. Into. Yes. The media, they turned him into a stereotype. If you read his book, mm-hmm. uh, the politics of ecstasy, I mean, this guy had a supreme intellect. He had a his yeah. intellect is far superior than the the people who stereotyped him and derided him. Well, well that's easy to believe. I mean, yeah, that happens With, all the without, time. I mean, I don't mean to be casting him in a positive light. I'm casting him in a truthful light here. Right, right, and, right. And, I, and, I understand. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And he is uh, to those who are a bit more familiar than the other generations who get only that cookie cutter uh, cardboard uh, cutout. Uh, to those that uh, do remember him a bit more vividly, uh, then yes, he's a compelling figure, and they used him to just basically uh, fill in airtime, so to speak. They just used him to take up space in the uh, in the documentary and make it interesting to the Woodstock generation, so to speak. But uh, yeah, he had a he had a mean he had a great laugh. Uh-huh. I, I I used to be able to imitate his laugh. It was so funny. He kind of go. <laughs> Well, well, he 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 looked like shit as he got older, which is the pity. I mean, he did not maintain himself, and it's kind of like Preston Nichols and everybody else. For some reason, they all began to degenerate. Uh, but uh, like somebody pushed a switch or something, and they just didn't give a shit anymore, and they just stopped showering and brushing their teeth. <laughs> that's, that's what happens. I, you know, that that's that's what that what's happened. Uh, as one gets older, they begin to become less impeccable about their appearance, and this is a, a typical. Uh, uh, you know, feature of age. You know, it may not apply with everybody. And you see some of these movie stars getting ridiculous plastic surgery. Uh, they look better without the surgery. But, you know, that's because they're image conscious. But in any case, um, you know, so so much. But back to this. this. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that there was something about the documentary that was very intent on fear pornography, that they were trying to uh, tell everyone now... Um, the lovely that's, grand. Excuse me. That's that's this this that's the the radio show. 
Okay, this, okay, this, thank this, you. This, we're going back to the documentary, which was The Dark Files, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, you know, was on TV a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it only ran once. Uh, and it, it, it just, it was a very poor documentary because if you're doing, uh, and they ended up showing Preston and they were making him look like a, you know, an idiot. And they, uh, and you, you got to admit, he kind of helped them with that. <laughs> I mean, by that, I mean, he just, as you said, he was not conscious about what his what he was saying and how it would sell or how it would, you know, it just fly, how it would fly. It's just not. Well, it, yeah. And, and he really didn't care. Yeah. And, and and then then it was uh, they all I'm trying to think if uh, this was the show where they ambushed the Swerdlows. And it was it was Christopher Garantano who ambushed the Swerdlows, and the Swerdlows. Uh, uh, Stewart had been involved in this earlier production uh, with with John Brody, and then he was like, you know, sort of partnering in some capacity with Garantano. They were they were, they were in the same uh, bed, so to speak. And so so anyway, what happened is. Uh, they were interviewing Stuart in Stuart's house mm -hmm. with Janet, and then they started attacking him mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, trying to expose him as a fraud or whatever. In his own home? Oh, yeah. Wow. Now, Holy you can shit. understand. <laughs> That's awful. And, and when I met with the crew, they asked me about Stuart Swerdlow, and I told them of my experiences, what, which were just like what I said to you the other night. Right. And they basically... The guy, uh, the producer, uh, was the director, the director says, he says, well, he basically thought that Stewart was grifting, mm -hmm. grifting off of Montauk and taking advantage of the situation to, you know, uh, you know, whatever that they did not, they didn't have a high opinion of him. However, what, what was so, I guess, despicable about the situation was that Garitano had buddied up to Swerdlow and then he was, he was engineering the ambush to the point mm. where they... They were like saying, how could you, you know, Christopher, I'm surprised at you. How could you do this? And, and he, Garitano's just like, oh, man, like he scored, like he did the big number on him, you know. And and then they had actually written to me and said, you know, they would like to uh, testify against Garitano if I was going to sue him. And I said, I'm not, I'm not going to be involved in any lawsuit here. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had no desire to be involved uh, in any lawsuit because I, I'm not going to, I don't consider it that imp him that important. You know, right? Uh, and nor nor to have enough money to be worth pursuing. Yeah, that, so, that that's what struck me as odd about what you just described was like, uh, you know, what the fuck did they get out of it other than some kind of uh, gratification of uh, perhaps uh, preventing him from uh, quote unquote grifting off of others? I suppose he's he's definitely strikes me as just kind of small fry. Uh, well, but what's very odd about that whole thing. Now, after that aired. Book sales did very well, mm -hmm. but Stewart's book, which has been a very good seller, The Healer's Handbook, mm -hmm. which really has nothing to do with Montauk or anything, right. it's it's actually it's a very interesting book. Uh, it 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 kind of atrophied in sales. I said, and it was like I couldn't explain it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. I mean, was you know, it's not like everybody says, "Oh, let's not go buy his book." That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. But the book the book kind of died, and now it's just it's flying off the shelves right now. I, I had to get it reprinted. Whoa. So um, it's been through so many reprintings that the, 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 the film wore out. I had to create a new cover. Whoa. And, uh, so um, anyway, uh, that, that was just kind of an odd thing. But uh, so then we go forward another year and it's a different company who's doing a different... Oh, now, of course, they didn't mention... David Anderson. They didn't mention time travel, where it had gone to, the advances that had made what I discovered and researched. They completely shit canned the 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 investigation, the story. They weren't interested in it. They didn't know how to tell it, or they had another agenda. So that was a, a big omission, a critical omission. Right. And and with that, I'm going to uh, bring in some questions from the chat room, uh, just directly relevant to what you said about the uh, time travel. So uh, I'll just, uh, by the way, just kind of indulge myself here uh, for a second and uh, 
engage everyone in the chat room because I think that's important. I believe, actually, that Mr. Moon had some exchanges in the chat room with Underfell Girl Sands, who is, of course, Sarah Shields, a uh, lovely lady who is with us. And uh, so... Not, not, not tonight, I haven't. Oh, you haven't? Oh, somebody... I haven't exchanged with her because I have... I'm. Uh, I'm not even looking at the computer while I talk to you. I see. Actually, uh, so, looking at TV while I, I talk I, to you. I see. Somebody explained to her about the um, heater that you were talking about, the fan. So the Dyson, uh, I thought it was you. The Dyson fan, yeah. Yeah, the Dyson, yeah. And so uh, Ravenator said loud and clear. So shout out to Ravenator. Uh, King Raw 85 says loud and clear, brothers, with a nice big muscle arm, uh, big bicep there. Uh, God bless him. Uh, Derek Talley says, press the like button, please, for our video. So don't forget to do that, Mr. Moon. And uh, so... The like button? What, 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 what is he talking about? Oh, he's talking about on the video itself, if you actually go to um, the link on my promotional oh, banner. Oh, or the, the like button. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's light. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so um, uh, Underfell Girl Science is Sheriff Shield says, I did, Derek. Thanks for reminding me. Lena Crane is there. God bless her. And uh, so uh, Sarah was asking, how do you spell that, Peter? And then she says, Dyson, okay. It was like somebody had answered her. So some, somehow she got the uh, spelling. Uh, JMO joined us. And uh, what we are getting is Elizabeth C. God bless her, says, hi, DD team. Yep. And uh, she says, thank you, Derek. I donated through PayPal. Go DD team. God bless you, honey. And JMO72, uh, who is, of course, JMO Reese, a uh, young black African-American man who says, question for Peter. I read at some point they had opened uh, portals at Montauk, is what he's uh, saying, which were like windows connecting 20-year time spans. Would it be logical to deduce that in having such a loop, they could generate energy without limits. They were connected to uh, the Eldridge in the book. Uh, also curious if they caught any men who have evanced during the Montauk project, which is a subject brought up through my own background. Uh, so you don't need to answer the last part of it. It may be an element of the narrative you're not familiar with yourself. What does evanesced mean? I don't understand that word. Oh, it's a term for fading. It's a Greek term. It was used uh, for a certain phenomenon uh, that was described to myself uh, by my late and sainted sire, uh, my father, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, the man who raised me. And uh, But um, you and I can go into that privately later. Uh, rather, the first two elements of the question would be more directly pertinent to your own experience and, and your research into the matter, which is question for Peter. I read at some point they had opened portals, which were like windows connected. I, I see the question now. I'm, I'm in oh, the okay. chat. Oh, good, good. Okay. And I, I uh, and, and by the way, I can't answer that, that last question because I, I don't, I don't have any information on it. Uh, Maybe if, 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 if Douglas and I talk about it, it might stir something up that I might remember. But to answer the questions, uh, first off, uh, what he's taught, what the, the person is asking, yes, they had, um, Preston had said that there was a 20 year biorhythm that occurs every August 12th uh, in, in, like, say, every 20 years. And the Philadelphia experiment would be August 12th, 1943. This biorhythm can occur anywhere, according to Preston, from August 10th to August 14th. Now, there is a consistency of 20-year happenings. Uh, beginning in 1903, August 12th, when Aleister Crowley marries his wife, Rose Kelly, who I believe, but do not know, to be genetically connected to Edward Kelly, the partner of John D. Um, but Rose Kelly, uh, they and they got married on August 12th, and then later in April of the following year, they had sex in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid, which precipitated the translation of the Book of the Law by Aleister Crowley, August 8th, 9th, and 10th. I mean, April 8th, 9th, and 10th of 1904. Um, 20 years later, in 1923, uh, according to a, a trans medium, I don't know what she calls herself, a channel, uh, Maya Shemayam uh, or Maya Hayes or Christina Star Eagle Hayes, mm -hmm. she had said that there was a ritual of the Black Sun, Black Sun in 1923 that was conducted 
It's been a, it's in one of my books. I but, believe it was Alistair. Well, but believe it or not, just a few days from now on December fifth will be the solar return of my late and sainted Cyrus. Uh, Diana Takabashi Hideko Sujin Lin, uh, who was born in December 5th of 1923. Uh, so not saying there's a connection with that, but uh, all could be. Could be. Uh, and, and then uh, today is, is the, the death day, uh, 62nd anniversary of Aleister Crowley's death. Uh, if I've computed right. Maybe I haven't computed right. Maybe it's the 70. Uh, he died in 47. Mm-hmm. So that would be uh, 50. That that's more like, uh, you know, well, uh, well some, something like yeah, uh, 67, 69 yeah, yeah. years ago. So today, today is the is the, is the anniversary of his death. But um, interesting. So in 1943, 20 years later, was the Philadelphia experiment. In 1963, was now this is a very obscure but very interesting is what's called the ITT Brentwood project. Mm-hmm. And Preston always said he didn't know too much about it. Uh, nobody knew too much about it. There is a man in Long Island who has actually supplied me at one time a photograph of it. I don't know if I still have it, uh, Joe Zapardo. And it basically, the ITT Brentwood project was the forerunner of the Harp project, the forerunner. Oh, fascinating. Well, my sister was born in 1963. <laughs> so go on. <laughs> what, what, what day? What day? March in in the month of March, I I could never remember her birthday because she became a Jehovah's Witness and they don't celebrate birthdays. So I forgot what the fuck her birthday was after a number of years uh, because she was so hot on evading it. But it was it was uh, it was, it was March. <laughs> I remember it was March. Well, uh, yeah, that was. And, and that both- was- both my parents died in the month of March at the age of 87. My father died in the month of March at the age of 87. And five years later, my mother died in the month of March at, at the age of 87. Uh, so that, that there's the synchronicity in all of this. Uh, but, but go on. Well, they, got, they, got, they had long lives. And, and from what I understand, their lives were kind of had a lot of struggle and hardship. So yes. when, when you can, it's, you've got uh, it's some pretty strong DNA. Yes. Yes, very much so. If it, if the doctors hadn't been working so hard to kill them uh, with every uh, thing they could possibly do to uh, fuck them over uh, with missed diagnoses, um, uh, misadministration of prescription meds, uh, and plain malpractice, just uh, if it hadn't been for uh, so many factors, they would still be alive today, I'm sure either well, one of them. This is one of the problems, and I have a lot more experience aging than you do, because I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, we spoke of that. We spoke of this when I told him about my going into a colonoscopy on the 9th. Uh, he gave me some fairly, uh, uh, shall we say, um, uh, detailed uh, advice. But we won't go into that right now. So, But, but go into the other yeah. stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Tell yeah. me about but the aging. The thing is, I'm well, just just a, a side light on, on aging. Yes. Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm very uh, healthy for a person of my age. Yes. 66. Yes. Where I've been uh, breaking down is athletically, because mm-hmm. I still play football. And now, as I say, I just had a wonderful healing on Thanksgiving where I'm going on adrenal supplements. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was told by my, my good friend and, and doctor, uh, that he gave me a healing I was not anticipating. He invited me to Thanksgiving, and boy, I got more than I bargained for in a very good way. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's put me back on adrenal supplements that I was on because I weaned off of them because he says, no, you should be doing fine. So I, I, I hope to build back my athleticism. But what, what happens when people get old, and I say this from observing them, is they begin to fall apart and they can no longer sustain themselves in different ways, whether it be through walking, whether it be through cleaning themselves. I mean, it, it goes in stages. But what happens is when, you, when it gets to the point where you're in a hospital and people, you're dependent on people to take care of certain things for you. This is a deterioration of the mind-body-soul complex. And it's it's almost like when you have to depend on other people to do things for you that you cannot do on your own, whether it's a medical reason or an enfeebled reason, it's like you're once you cross the line into the into the hospital, you're you're really on your way out. And uh, it's unfortunate. That's part of how death works. So you've got to get your foot on the other side and out of the hospital because it it's like a uh, an entropy yeah. uh, 
well, you it's know, a vortex. It, it's a it's a vortex. It's a it, exactly, and it's like, so it's like you know, and and you and I was explaining this to my daughter who's taking care of her grandmother right now. She gets very frustrated because the grandmother doesn't eat the right things. She doesn't drink enough water. She'll have uh, too much coffee. And I said, listen, you have to understand. She's she wants to die. She wants to, a part of her wants to go in another direction. Yeah. You've got to not get frustrated because it's just a you know there's a part of you that wants to die. And there's a part of you that wants to live. It's like two personalities because it's, you know, it's time to let go. And this is what people struggle with. Um, but whatever. Now, back to I, I was talking but, about. By the way, just so people know the technical term for it, the technical term for the death drive is thanatos, uh, the Greek word that was personified by a beautiful young man who would seduce people into coming to the other side as he was envisioned by the Greeks because, of course, uh, as uh, Peter Moon knows, they were primarily a homoerotic culture. <laughs> and so uh, uh, they uh, definitely had this Thanatos uh, uh, archetype uh, for the death drive. That... I learned something. I didn't know that. That's that's fascinating. I didn't know about Thanatos. Yeah. Um, um, that's where the term thanatize comes from, where to thanatize someone. Thanatology is the study of death itself and death processing. And I often reference that my father was thanatized. Uh, it was because uh, of what was done to him uh, just uh, ensured his death. As a matter of fact, one of the things that was a decisive comorbidity, as I shared with Peter Moon, was the colonoscopy. But, of course, my dad was 87 years old. If they had found, actually found cancers in his intestine, what the fuck would they have done at the age of 87? They would might they, be better off to just leave him as he is. What do you need? Yeah, like leave, let him die on his own. It, it, yeah, right? they, well, they didn't need to even give him the colonoscopy. This, this is the, it was the first and last colonoscopy he had. It was one of the things that killed him. It's one of the reasons why people tell me not to take it. Of course, I'm much younger than my father. I have every confidence I'm not going to be impacted in such a fashion. But, um, you know, all part of uh, what you and I were discussing and, um, uh, definitely, uh, Mr. Moon. I, I'm going to assume has not had one. And, no. Uh, no. So, so yeah, there you have that. I mean, th though they try to encourage because of, in my case, they're juicing the insurance. Let's be real. I mean, because I'm on Medicare and Medi-Cal, there's no question the money is going to be there. So uh, they just want it. But they try to encourage everyone to get this done. And so, uh, but but all of that aside, uh, I really appreciate your bringing up what you did about. Um, I, I myself, I can't understand why you still want to play football. I mean, I myself try to avoid any activity that I fucking can. I will, I will, I will tell you why. I was just telling my wife. She encourages me to play. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, but th this is it. It, it. I remember I must have been about 12. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also remember similar, well, maybe when I was nine, uh, being out in the you know overcast day being out on the field with the guys and it's like muddy mm -hmm. and you're muddy and you're playing football and it's like you're connected to the earth we, we were talking about that the other day with sex when you connect mm -hmm. you make a connection with somebody mm -hmm. uh how important it is to to have a connection uh but it's like connecting with the elements and the earth you're sitting there you're muddy you're you're having fun, you're playing a game, you're with all these guys, mm -hmm. and it's just like, wow, it was just so much fun. It, it's like, wow, I, I said, I like this game, I love this game. Uh, football has been very kind to me as a sport, where, you know, it's really devastated some people. Oh, it destroyed lives. I, I, <laughs> well, you know. well, well, yeah, and as I said, well, like, well, like we play, um, and it's it's basically a friendly game, and, and while there's, there's uh, a, a certain amount of, I guess, what you call physical dexterity and and brawniness to it it's it's you know we try and play it with uh good cheer and not hurting each other it's very rarely does does uh, somebody inflict punishment on somebody and then and then it's put a stop to but many so many times i've seen you know a guy come out who hadn't played you know since he was in his 20s and he comes out and there goes his achilles yeah. that guy's never do anything athletically again uh we've had people who are fine athletes who get hurt and uh, they never come out again. And there's been so many, and I, I've been playing with these guys since 1993. And the only times I've ever gotten hurt is, is uh, when I have basically hurt myself uh, with a, with a pulled muscle, a pulled this, uh, a pulled hamstring. 
it, it's never been because somebody damaged me. Yeah, so, um, oh and, and it's just, it's fun. It's for me, it's fun. And I know I don't feel, never feel endangered. I've been suffering from uh, inability to uh, maintain the skeleton, like running. It's like, I can't, I can't run like I used to. So I think that's going to repair itself. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, that's a far cry from becoming enfeebled right. in, in just a regular well, state. Yeah. I, I mean, as a, as a normally functioning person, you're at, um, you're at peak level of efficiency. I, I, and the average person your age envies you uh, enormously. And uh, of course, uh, I too am uh, young for my age. I, the, the time that I actually got uh, whacked uh, so, so terribly was uh, due in large part to uh, a kind of psychiatry, uh, the, the kind where I had to go through a period of uh, taking antidepressants for a period of time. And I can see why some people uh, like one young lady I knew, uh, not knew intimately, and I didn't know her terribly well, but she was a tenant in my gang brother's apartment. And uh, she was a young uh, Caucasian, a white European American female. Um, and she um, unfortunately uh, was on antidepressants and um, she chose not to take them because of course they bloated her so terribly. So she chose death over antidepressants and I never understood it until I was on antidepressants. <laughs> understand why she chose death over the antidepressants she ultimately killed herself but uh god they 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 bloat at me they they did uh terrible things to me physically uh i never felt uh depressed on them but i never felt really uplifted either and so it was a period that was proving uh for the sake of what my psychiatrist wanted to prove that i could not physically tolerate them which gave the permission and the go-ahead for some extreme uh, uh, hypno hypnotherapy, what was called hypnosurgery, uh, and the removal of uh, certain memories uh, from myself, which I went into with uh, Crystal Rivers and uh, uh, Peter Moon uh, when uh, they were last on with us. And we may cover some aspects of that again the next time she's on with us uh, soon enough. But uh, in terms of, yeah, in terms of uh, psychiatry, yes, my experiences have not necessarily been all that positive when it came to uh, the, the medicine of it. And it was also a factor, by the way, in the death of a hero of my father's and mine and, and my mother's. Uh, who My mother dearly loved the character of Sherlock Holmes and the man who portrayed him that my whole family uh, enjoyed and adored was uh, Jeremy Brett. And Jeremy Brett ultimately died because of antidepressants that bloated him terribly, uh, made him sick, and uh, ultimately... Uh, uh, were a comorbidity factor, as they call it, a, a factor in his dying. Uh, so yes, there there are there are people that these medicines uh, ravage. And uh, but but in terms of uh, uh, this, you know, football thing with uh, Peter Moon, I'll stick with the sex. I mean, um, you can have that, your that's your game. I mean, you know, I grew up, <laughs> I, I I grew up playing it. You have to understand when I was like probably three, uh, yes. they would play on my front yard. Uh, because we had a, a front yard that ran into the neighbors. So it had the best uh, layout of grass on the entire block to play football. Nice. And what would happen is all these kids, you know, would play. They'd come to our yard and play. They didn't ask. They just played. And my mother tolerated it. Mm -hmm. And I would go out on the porch and watch. Now, this was a great treat for me because if these older kids got a hold of me, they're going to pick on me or do something in normal life. It's just the way it was. I was the, the youngest kid on the block. So uh, it, it's sort of a natural bullying phenomena that I kind of was used to. I didn't go out, you know. Uh, and But when, when they would play football, uh, I, I would sit there and watch, and oh, they were so sweet to me, because my mother would be at the kitchen window, and they knew <laughs> that if, if they started messing with me, my mom was going to run them off off the, the property. Right. So they were so sweet to me. And, and then the ball would come to me uh, and, and I pick it up and throw it to them. And they go, oh, oh, wow. And they, you know, they and they just like, you know, be so nice to me. Wow. And it was like, this was different. So football was like, wow, this is like, <laughs> I'm important. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then as I got older, of course, uh, I, I would play. And uh, just to be on the on the field with these guys, and of course they they 
they do they call, call canning the center where you they you have to hike the ball because that's all you're good for when you start out and you're little and then they throw your head underneath your legs and <laughs> and, and you know uh, you just but you're out there playing and it's like you're one of you're not one of them but you're you're allowed to play and then of course as I got older. Uh, and went to school. I was bigger than everybody else in the school, so I, I didn't. I didn't have bully issues after uh, I got out of that neighborhood. After you know, your growth spurt, yes, that's that's. Well, well, I mean, it's just like I was physically bigger than people older. I wasn't huge, uh, but I was physically bigger. So that that just didn't uh, wasn't a factor in you know once I got into kindergarten. Right. Whereas, you know, I, I've watched these poor people in Scientology that are so bullied psychologically or physically that, you know, it's just really unfortunate. Everybody faces that at different times. So, uh, you know, we all have different paths. We all have different things. Athletics was a very big part of my younger life and, and something I, I still, uh, you know, enjoy uh, to participate. It's, you know, it's been with me my whole life. So, uh, when I when I leave that, <laughs> I, I will go into another phase. Right, um, right. It, but but um, believe me, I I hope you will adapt because I I certainly don't want yourself to identify with the football no. because it's obviously something you can't. Uh, I mean, it's something to identify with, yes. But uh, obviously, well, well, yeah. Listen to this. Yeah. Uh, I I asked my clairvoyant friend about it. And she says, "Oh, March Champion. March Champion is like 101 years old. She was a a famous dancer." very famous dancer and her and she says watch her youtube and what march champion says she says every decade you lose something she says like she says a dancer knows how to dance but they they know psychologically how to dance but they can't do it physically anymore uh after a certain point i'm not talking about ballroom dancing i'm talking about very you know ballet and that sort of thing right. so she said with each decade you lose something but something else comes in that you didn't have and it, it's it's even better this is and this is her psychology to, to living so i as soon as i accepted that uh all of a sudden i'm being fed uh adrenal supplements uh and also um i don't i, I can tell you the name of it i was given a bag full of this herb it's called Shirik Sinango. No, 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 not that. No, that, that's something else. That's, it's Chuchuasi. Wow. It strengthens the bones, uh, related issues, endurance, and virility, uh, which I'm not taking it for. <laughs> don't, need, don't need it for that. But, um, but strength, it's like this, and I, that's got a tincture I, I made, uh, and that's two weeks it's got to sit. So in two weeks, I'll start taking that. And uh, if if I if this thing works, I will uh, be more than impressed. Wow. And I expect it to work because, like, say, uh, I had a short amount of sleep, mm -hmm. and I don't I don't have to as long as I'm taking these adrenal supplements. Mm -hmm. I don't need the coffee to stay up and talk to you. Wow. I uh, I don't need. I'm getting minimum sleep, so it's it's really working. And all this, by the way, mm -hmm. adrenaline or adrenals is they're on the back of the kidneys and kidneys are what give you your adrenal support. So if you have weakened kidneys, you know, this, this is a, you know, obviously a, t a tender area, something mm -hmm. I need to do more Qigong on that area of the kidneys mm -hmm. uh, to, you know, resuscitate them or improve them. Right. And this, it's like, so if you have a weakness, uh, you strengthen the weakness. And, and it's that simple because it's life is all about internal organs. And Qigong, you, you're, you've got five lobes in your lungs and you want to feed each one of these with as much oxygen as you can because they all, the, the lungs, the lobes of the lungs all go into specific in, internal organs. So if the organs are being supplied with oxygen, they will last. You won't die of organ failure, which is called natural causes. So this is this is very important. So the fact that I do qigong also sustains me, uh, etc. But to get back to the documentary. Oh yeah. Which, By the way, before you do, uh, J Mo says much thanks, and he says Kelly's last name was Talbot before he changed it. I think he says I actually tried to see if I could connect the two during a doing a genealogical search, but nothing came up. 
And Monty Royale says, uh, YouTube isn't notifying me of your stream, but it sounds great. <laughs> Thank you, Monty Royale. Uh, but um, yeah, so so finish what you're saying, but I do want to get to... Edward Talbot Kelly is what Edward Kelly is known as, Edward Talbot Kelly. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and Talbot, of course, was the name used in the movie The Wolfman, uh, Larry Talbot. Right. Uh, uh, very, very strange family the Talbots were. They had a castle, uh, I think, in a place, I want to call it Limerick Island, mm -hmm. uh, if that's the name of the place. But in any case, uh, back to the uh, the documentary. Right, and, uh, and eventually take us, of course, to the fear porn of Coast to Coast AM, because I'll bring well, that, up... That, yeah. That's where we're going. Yeah. This is the, So anyway, we had this... Uh, and then, then there was another documentary which, which uh, done uh, showed last August, done in April, that had nothing to do with Chris Garitano. And that was, they finally showed me for about 14 minutes or so, but they omitted any mention of David Anderson. Uh, and, and they had Michio Kaku discounting his patent. But oh, right, the, the Japanese house nigger, by the way. The, yes. yeah, this, this is, Michio Kaku is the son of a bitch they bring on, the Jap house nigger, who, you know, I use that term, of course, being of some Japanese extraction myself, mind you, but it, guys like that just make me sick. This is the kind of guy who gets on there. Uh, he doesn't speak a word of Japanese. He's, he's totally raised in American acculturated. This is all he's ever known. And uh, he, he just uh, gets up there and uh, tells white people what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. And uh, he basically was, this is interesting, they didn't mention David Lewis Anderson, but they were deconstructing his technology. So, uh, and by the way, JMO says, thanks for clarifying. So uh, um, thanks to Mr. Reese for uh, presenting that question. And uh, with that, um, Peter, give us uh, why you think they were doing this. Like, do you think they felt that David Lewis Anderson, not enough people had heard about him? Or no, they... no, no, no. I, I supplied the patent application. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, they, and now when I did supply it mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in real time, it was accompanied with questions and answers about Dr. David Anderson. And of course, they were they were very interested. They asked me about Romania. All that stuff was taped, but they chose not to show it. I I, I would readily agree that Romania is too much to throw into the mix in a forty four minute or whatever it was documentary. Mm -hmm. But with commercials, it's an hour. So mm -hmm. that I didn't have an issue. But they didn't they didn't mention him. And they said, uh, okay, well, let's look at this patent. And he looks at it. and He says, well, this is like the child, uh, the scrawlings of a child. And he says. You see, it has no power source, and you need the power uh, the size of a of a of a what did he call, of a black hole, right? And Pulsar my, or black hole. He always uses a cosmic a cosmic term. Yes, he loves to say black hole all the time. He, he always loves to reference black holes. Um, he doesn't even know what a black hole is. <laughs> but but uh, th this he really doesn't. I mean, he knows something about it, but not uh, anyway. There's just a whole article, and they're starting to discover things of black black holes. And it's you can get fundamental information on a black hole in the book recently published this year, Inside the Earth by Radu Sinemar. It's just astounding what is said about black holes, but we won't go into that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so Michio Kaku is basically saying that there's no power source. Well, there is a power source. There is an explanation of the power source in the patent application. Uh, and, and he's just basically denying it and he's not reading it or he's read it and he doesn't want it. Now, uh, my friend, who well, I th I I think, how, how about that? He may understand what he's looking at and he's paid to discount it. I don't think he's smart enough. <laughs> fact, I don't think he's smart enough. And, and, but one of my, my the, the girl who participated in the documentary with me, uh, who has had some very real experiences time traveling, which I've even witnessed, she she said, I you know she says, well you know she says I think I think it's jealousy. He's jealous mm -hmm. because you know he's the top. He's won a Nobel Prize for what he came up with on string theory, and when you see the Nobel Prize presentation, these people are dressed in. Uh, you know, tuxes and, and, and it's so prestigious. It's so pompous. And it's like, uh, it looks ridiculous if you look at what they're ignoring. It's like they're, they're like the emperor with no clothes, mm -hmm. you know, but they, no, but no, but they, they're wearing tuxes. So everybody thinks they're well dressed mm -hmm. and the immense arrogance, immense arrogance and stupidity. Mm 
uh, of what what we will deny and what we will ignore. But I'm I'm used to this. Well, yeah, but so, you see, yeah, I I can reinforce and validate everything you're saying about Michio Kaku and why I think he's a paid uh, suppression agent, because when German scientists uh, developed the holy grail of transport, uh, which was teleportation, uh, albeit, of course, this is a far cry from doing so at the level which would be orders of magnitude above what they were able to do, they were uh, basically getting down the basics of it. They used a series of laser beams and they successfully teleported what physicists call classical information, sans the transfer of either matter or energy. So this is teleportation. There's no denying this. So this was developed in United Germany. And we're talking about in uh, uh, decades ago that this was done. And when they did this, it was said even then this would ultimately be used towards quantum computing to sling data bits uh, without even the necessary uh, wires to uh, transfer the information and therefore creating computers that were less and less physical, almost uh, entities unto themselves that were cloud-like in nature themselves. Uh, so the first thing that Michio Kaku did was he went on a campaign to try and say, none of this was real, that none of this had happened or that any of this was relevant. Now, uh, whatever has been done with it, the Germans have kept uh, so secret, it's so classified, because obviously this is a matter of national and international security, that uh, it's pretty much disappeared off the charts or off the radar. Uh, but uh, in terms of Michio Kaku and what he did, this strikes me that the man is basically a paid disinformation agent, a suppression agent, someone who suppresses information. So I think that that's what he's paid to do. And so it doesn't matter whether he understands it or, or not, but you're probably right. He probably doesn't, because when I see him on his science television shows, he just pulls shit out of his ass. And, and, and he'll say things like, uh, you know, uh, is it conceivable for a Death Star to destroy the Earth? I mean, just preposterous questions. They come up in a science fictional context and he'll come up with some science fictional response. Uh, yes, well, if we had, uh, you know, uh, a Death Star or this level of technology, then, I mean, at this point, you're speaking in uh, hypotheses anyway. Uh, so, well, I, I have to, this is very, you bring up a very important point. And, and it's like when, when you see somebody like him, uh, and, and this is without uh, knocking him, uh, well, a little bit of a knock. It, I've seen him interviewed, and he'll say something, and the, and the host will say, what does that mean? <laughs> so it's, it, it's like he's talking gobbledygook because he's speaking in a way that you would you would – quote unquote, have to be a physicist to understand. That does no good. And I, I found this with physics uh, as a subject because I really had to delve deep into it when I did these videos to see how physicists would say this and that. And basically the, the science of physics, they make up words that are used to explain words that were used in, you know, like they'll take the ether and they'll call it something else. They'll, they'll use a, a quote unquote scientific name for ether. Oh yeah, essentially that's the ether, but uh, we're gonna call it this because we don't believe in the ether. You know, it's like, it's so convoluted. And, and because I've been on certain websites and people don't, they're not open to learning. They have their own ideas. And of course these ideas are not demonstrable anywhere. And I mean, they're not, they, they just like ideas and they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, it's they're very convoluted and complicated, so uh, it's it's a problematic subject. Other than the most basic concepts of Newtonian physics, which are uh, all you know definitely uh, reliable within the context of a uh, whirling sphere like the Earth. Hmm. Uh, Mechanical but that's application, all, right? It, it, it's it's yeah. applied mechanics. So go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but there's but that's the Newtonian physics, and it's all subject to the spin of the Earth. Um, when you don't have the spin of the Earth, you've got a, a different game at work. And there are other things that supersede Newtonian physics, but that's a, that's a whole other subject. But in any case, um, so much. It's it, but but the the important point was, 
it, you know, the TV hosts, of course, why would you expect them to understand it? Because most of them are not trained. And then the general public, some people understand things, some people don't. But what I've noticed uh, with the work of Dr. David Anderson, when I had a, a, a group of 100 people, and I, uh, this is a couple years ago, and I was interlocked. Uh, being the interlocutor between him and them, I allowed them to ask questions, and, and he was gracious. But none, almost all of the questions, 97% of the questions, were, uh, it, were, were not good questions because they were asking him stuff about that was not his expertise. It's, it's like asking you about how many RBIs did Willie Mays hit in 1965? You know, it's like, right. what, why would I ask Douglas D for Thank this? you. <laughs> you know, uh, and these are the kind of questions he was being asked, in, not about uh, not about baseball, but about about metaphysics. Right. And, and it, it really wasn't his field. And I realized that people don't really understand who he is or what his, his role is. Uh, and, and And this is, so it's like the general public is, it's like, why do they even need to know this stuff? Uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of challenging because everything I've learned about this stuff, I've had to really persevere mm -hmm. and uh, struggle, I guess the word is struggle, and be very patient and meticulous to discover this and, and be very lucky. So it's like, what is the, you know, what, what is really going on here? Now, of course, there's always a entertainment factor and people are interested and some people do genuinely learn from what I present and it helps, you know, they enjoy it. It, it, it enlightens them in some capacity. But th this is a this is a big problem. Uh, like, why does anybody need to <laughs> know anything? Okay. You know, it's it's. Um, well, well uh, there's a, uh, you know, we could go into that. Uh, it, it's one of these things where, obviously, there's a popularization of science so that people can get funding. And um, even David Lewis Anderson, I, I suspect, in a sense, needed that. Um, what, was the, um, what was the connection between Romania and India, where David Lewis Anderson had some shops set up? He had something going on in India. So, so, yeah. so yeah, what was the... What was that? How did that fit in? Oh, well, when I last spoke to him, he had cooled down on India because he didn't like the way I forget. I, you know, I, I'm not meticulous on remembering everything about India mm -hmm. uh, because it was one faction that he didn't like the way they were they were operating, mm -hmm. and he kind of withdrew his presence from India. Uh, and and I don't really know what he's doing except that he's been very active in ham radio. Uh, in teaching young people ham radio uh, because, you know, in, in the case of a collapse, ham radio will be the first place of communication, maybe the only place of communication. And by the way, my mission, and I, I've got people that have accepted the, the mission, I, I wanted to, to uh, bring four people to Romania with me next year who were going to contribute $700 each to build a ham radio uh, station in, uh, at the camp near Chocolavina Cave. Uh, so I've actually got people to accepted this mission. Uh, you know, if they cough up the money in the next few months, then I will know they're for real. But they want to travel with me. The exchanges, they get to travel with me and they get to have an adventure there. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing this because I was inspired to do it when I was there. And it will also give David the capacity to talk to one of his favorite areas on the planet, if he's interested. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he's interested. I, I mean, uh, but uh, he certainly will have the opportunity uh, to, to do this. So that's quite an adventure and a project for me to, uh, to set up. All the wheels are in motion, and I think it will happen. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that's what he's been up to. I don't know what he does in the field of time. I don't know exactly where he is. He, he, you know, he has his, if he spends a lot of time at, at his center in New Mexico, if it's still in New Mexico, I really don't know. But uh, with regard to India, uh, they, he, you know, he, he fell away from them because he didn't like what they were doing. Okay. That, that's all I really know. And when he last spoke publicly in 2000, 
17 when my, my in-laws had an event at in Garden City, Long Island, which I participated in and, of course, arranged the whole thing. They had invited David to come and he Skyped in. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was very, uh, what, what, he really stressed how many non-disclosure agreements he was under. And I've had to wonder, because he was, he never had a problem getting funding, as far as I know. What he's had a problem with is his partners, whatever that means, whether it means government or whatever, have been very uh, stingy with sharing the technology. He's had videos prepared, he's done all sorts of things, but they never are released. Now, because his initial funding was in the medical field, from in people interested to preserve organ preservations for uh, slowing down the rate of time of, 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 of decay of an organ, mm. and this is, now, this gets very intriguing when you choose to speculate, because this is all speculation. If his funding, first of all, the people providing the funding, whether it be the government or private sources, are very stingy in, re in, in releasing any information, having him release any information. So if they're so stingy, we can understand the government being stingy, but what if, if this interest in medical funding was by people like Jeffrey Epstein, who was very eager to invest in medical stuff, anything cutting edge. He was very open-minded about that. And uh, he was trying to get in every scientific uh, invention he could. So if it's either Epstein, Epstein's people, it, you know, it's quite possible that people like that could have funded that or helped him fund what he was doing. I really don't know. And I don't know I, and I'm sure that he would not be able to say anything about it. Uh, it's just an interesting speculation. Why, why is his research kept under such wraps, such wraps, extreme, to where he has to uh, basically be a non-person? Uh-huh. So, uh, and, um, of course, uh, I thank you for sharing that. And um, I have my own... Um impressions of course and i've shared them of course on my own uh, uh program in the past and uh we could discuss uh, some of that in the near future as well uh, both privately and and uh on transmission but uh so so in terms of what coast to coast am did working towards yes. that again with the, the fear porn they were spreading that uh one of the things that um the grandma named judith Ager had always been impressed by this kind of uh in, in, in impressed itself upon her uh uh, understandings of uh, potential uh, future scenarios. She was, uh, she had been essentially uh, impressed by the uh, concept of an apocalypse where instead of a zombie apocalypse, that many sleeper agents uh, were um, uh, basically supplied by our federal government or products thereof, byproducts of their mind control programs, the so-called super soldiers and super soldierettes uh, would uh, be triggered simultaneously at some point where they would uh, be unleashed in all their fury on the world around us. Uh, this, uh, of course, is somewhat relevant to, of course, the more manic ravings that I was subjected to uh, with uh, Dr. Henry, who, of course, had worked on my blood. And uh, when it comes to uh, everything that happened with a nanoplasma transfer and uh, my recovery, my death and my recovery, uh, death reanimation and recovery, uh, which is why some people had no qualms, including Aquino, as referencing myself as truly undead. Uh, we have this uh, situation, which, of course, is, uh, is, has got its time limits. We've got uh, a, a date of expiration on many of these human beings. They, of course, may be producing new ones. Uh, but obviously, people who were subject to these uh, programs where their minds were uh, cascaded with false memories... I would insist would be epitomized by someone like Andrew Bassagio, who was convinced he was inside of a teleportation machine, essentially with uh, uh, with Barack Obama. And uh, then we've got, of course, people like Al Bielik, who truly did have things happen to them. And uh, then essentially were cascaded with memories to obfuscate and confuse that so that they would tell a story that was coherent to extent and then 
blow it all for everyone by saying, and then I was, you know, uh, sent back in time to uh, be delivered as a baby so I could forget all of this. <laughs> it just well, you know, the, the mind has to fill the gaps. And yes. you see, you, 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 you want to you wanna fill, it's natural to want to fill the gaps. Mm -hmm. uh, just like it is to, you know, I mean, if, if you want to, you know, it's like you want to go on all the rides at Disneyland or something. I don't know. Uh -huh. It's it's like you gotta you gotta you gotta complete the the, the park the park, uh -huh. and so the circuit you're completing the circuit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and and it just it's like uh, they're they're trying and and they're 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 misfiring, but to to get back, see, I had presented a uh, a prequel by discussing this Chris Giratano character right. and how he parlayed into these uh, documentaries and whatnot. And so then um, he, uh, I, I got this phone call from this geophysicist and attorney friend of mine mm -hmm. who had been listening to the show, the Coast to Coast show being broadcast by Richard Sirrett, I, uh, I think is how you say his name, out of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And he was basically interviewing Christopher Garitano. And uh, as my friend said, it was a pretty good interview. And he said that, uh, Garitano was throwing out a lot of like tidbits and trying to make it more interesting and interesting, mentioning the Montauk Project, you know, book several times. Uh, and of course, when I heard that, I said, you know, the worst thing this show can do is produce book sales. Um, we'll see if it does. But in any case, he at about 45 minutes, then he started talking about Montauk Boys and the Montauk Boys are the sleepers, uh, the people who were programmed during the 1970s and early 80s to, uh, you know, to arise in the future and, you know, cause a revolt or, or carry out, you know, as Manchurian candidates to go wreak havoc on society or whatever the agenda was. Um, and so he's talking about this. And then all of a sudden, uh, according to, to my friend, the, the show cuts off and it goes dead. And then a whole different narrative comes on. It's a completely different show. As and he said, the impression they got was that they just cut the show to make it look like it had gotten too hot and too heavy. And this was utterly orchestrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Coast to Coast did that with a previous, uh, previously with an author of mine, Wade Gordon. Mm -hmm. uh, they, Wade had called me and said they, uh, Jim Mars was plagiarizing his work. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the book, The Brookhaven Connection. Oh, that's easy to believe. J Jim Mars was a piece of shit. And uh, he later on, of course, became a, a propagandist for Miscavige Scientology. And uh, that's, uh, I'm sure you're aware of that. I, I've heard that. Of course, he didn't do much good of anything. But, uh, <laughs> yes, um, I, I won't argue with that. So, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, go on. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, but anyway, because plagiarism had occurred, I didn't hear it. I didn't know. Wade had been in the radio business all his life, and he said, there's a special protocol you've got to follow. You've got to be very polite. And he basically coached me on what to say. So I'm, like, writing these emails to this producer, uh, I, I run him by Wade first, and he says, that's good, that's good, that's good. And and so uh, what this did was affect, for the first time in the history of uh, Sky Books, uh, well, I think Preston might have been on Coast to Coast uh, in the early days before things got too big. You're I think about Art, back in the days of Art Bell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, back and in so, the ham radio days, right. Yeah. And, oh, no, no, it was, it was, it, he was a big thing then, but... Uh, but Preston didn't oh, get Oh, no, no. One. What I meant to say was that uh, Art Bell was always a ham radio fan, even when he exploded. But go on. Yes. It, and, uh, yeah. So, so anyway, we had uh, one of my authors got on uh, Coast to Coast. And it was, uh, was going to be Wade Gordon because uh, and basically they were throwing us a bone to clear up the, you know, the bad. They, they were responsible for, you know, broadcasting plagiarized material. Mm -hmm. So... It was they were going to give us an interview with Wade Gordon and Wade had set it up, but he told me what to do. And and so Wade was on there. And after 45 minutes, they shut it down. And I he says, call the producer. I called the producer and she said, we shut it off for his own protection. Hey, what are you talking about? 
you know, well, you know, so people won't come after him. The government will come after him. And this was all, you know, he waits. So this is all bullshit. They just do that. <laughs> yes. They're trying to pump up their own ratings and entry. Yes. Yes. And, and then afterwards he says, oh, you know, they realized they didn't know, but they said, you're a real nice guy. And they, they were so surprised because they'd heard so much bad stuff about from Art Bell about you. They were blaming everything on Art Bell. And, and, uh, Wade used to tell me that Art Bell would would spend two hours on the phone, you know, telling people, you know, how bad I was. And he didn't even know me. And he said that uh, he, when he first got, began to work with me, he says, I can't believe all these people in the radio business that hate you. Now, I know why they hated me, because they didn't know me. They were being spread a lot of bad mouthing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just totally erroneous and irresponsible. My enemies were people, I couldn't see them and I didn't know who they were. That was very difficult because you don't know. You just know that you're basically banned from, you know, major media. Right. So anyway, uh, which is, you know, really a compliment uh, who, who would want to be with these people. So anyway, they said they realized that you're not such a bad guy and that they like you and they want to have all of your authors on. Uh, oh, okay, good. Okay, well, they can have my authors and and so somehow they chose to start with Al Bielik. Now, Al Bielik was not, never my author. He was a friend and a colleague, but he wasn't my author. I never wrote a book with him. And so they interviewed him. And the interview, uh, and then when they, they agreed to interview him, they set up an attack, an ambush on him. And Wade Gordon got word of 48 hours ahead of time there was going to be an ambush. And, and Al was warned. Mm -hmm. uh, and they set up a, a link to a, a website attacking Al. And Al predicted that successfully, correctly predicted that there would be a blackout between the 10th and 14th of August during the biorhythm. I don't know if I finished that guy's question. During the uh, Between the 10th and the 14th, there would be a blackout a major blackout and uh, there was a major blackout in New York and it was centered around Preston's property it was like the center of the blackout extended into Ohio uh, down into Long Island and north up towards Buffalo and whatnot and uh, the, the the blackout was predicted in 2003 this was the the, the 20 year biorhythm and of course that was the same time the the chambers underneath the Romanian Sphinx were discovered. But uh, to get back, to, I, I should go back to that guy's question. He was talking about the portals opening every 20 years. And I got off into, you know, 2023, 2043, 63. There was 83 was the Montauk Project, August 83. And then the August in 2003, we were waiting to see what would happen. It was the blackout in New York and the discovery of uh, the chambers beneath the Romanian Sphinx in 2003. So the next big happening will be in 2023, uh, which uh, will be something. And by that time, I should have gotten your first uh, three books out, hmm. uh, I would hope. So uh, that, could, that could help change the world. So in, in any case, um, it, we're, we're, I'm going to go back to that guy's question. There were time portals opened. Uh, that was the whole logic of it, uh, to answer his question. Uh, that's such a loop. They could generate energy without limits. No, they could not generate energy without limits. They had no control of it. During, According to the book and according to Preston Nichols, there was a connection between 1943 and 83, which sort of gave a – the two projects connected up with each other and gave a lot of energy. Uh, that if that could be harnessed, harnessed, it would produce virtually limitless energy. But Dr. David Anderson uh, has figured out how to produce tremendous energy, and it's much more advanced and controlled than what they had in those times. And you can look at his, if you look up D Dr. David Lewis Anderson uh, in Harvesting Energy, he's got two videos which explain this, how it works. Um, so I would refer you to that. But to get back to this these Montauk sleeper boys uh, that were being programmed, and, and as you were calling the fear porn on coast to coast, um, they cut this thing off. And what what I found very amusing, uh, first off, this is just trying to titillate people and scare them and make them react. 
any of the Montauk boys uh, would have been programmed in the 70s and early 80s. <laughs> they would be old men by now. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't even play in a football game. <laughs> no, they're going to come out in their wheelchairs and, and you know, attack. Uh, <laughs> And, and and it's it's sort of like, uh, you know, get over it. Um, and th these people did exist, of course, Manchurian candidates uh, or people compromised, but their ability to get together and do something, no, no, this is not going to happen. Uh, it, in fact, they're more interesting. They'd be more interested. There's other groups they can go to with political manipulations, like they do with this, uh, you know, stirring up radicals to uh, protest uh, or whatever. They, they have other ways of doing this now. And as Preston always said, mind control doesn't work. It does work on some people, but it, it, it has a lot of failures. And even Michael Aquino would agree with that. It, it's... Uh, it doesn't always work so well, but anyway, this is this is um, so so you know th this was something that recently aired, and I, I don't know what the effect. I only heard it from one person. I don't know. I think Coast to Coast has really suffered in its ratings. Oh yes, it's in the so I haven't been hearing anything about it, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't even know if it will sell any books because I don't just don't know how important that is to, in other, in other words there may not be enough people exposed to it for it to even uh have an impact and uh a lot of this has to do with exactly as you said uh coast to coast ratings and uh their ratings are in the tank and it doesn't matter if they've got enough people listening to it most of their people listening to their crap are just uh, people with no money to spend i mean they're welfare recipients and uh the homebound and the disabled and uh uh, you know, the people who uh, are listening to it who do have money, like night workers, like cops and uh, uh, nurses, uh, as opposed to the street walking prostitutes and the pimps who are the other night workers who listen to Coast to Coast. Uh, none of these people are interested in buying the crap that Coast to Coast sells, which is basically, you know, just plain crap. I mean, it's all you'd think it'd be along the lines of the ham radio, but it's not. It's just useless stuff like the wind up radio, uh, the sea crane and all that crap. So uh, it, it's, um, yeah, it's a dead end. And um, they're, they're basically there to keep the elderly pro, uh, propagandized on their deathbeds, on their hospice, on the way out, so that the generation doesn't find anything out uh, before it dies. They want them to go out as brainwashed and in, indoctrinated as they stayed all their lives. That's the real purpose of Coast to Coast AM. And anybody who listens to it will agree. I mean, there's nothing you hear except the same old shit by the same old fucks uh, <laughs> saying the same old shit over and over again. Uh, and uh, as I was bringing up while uh, Mr. Moon was gone for a minute when I asked him, uh, told him he could go uh, while I was kind of uh, e e going through the blurbs introducing the show. I mean, they have people on who are the worst of the worst. Uh, Richard Dolan and uh, Peter Lavinda. These are the people that that Niall Parkinson uh, was saying were the established authors that I was condemning as the uh, diabolatrous and uh, de uh, the uh, infernally oriented that they had always been. And now, of course, we're uh, fully into the tank with the uh, anti-gods uh, thematic that uh, Aquino's pushed on all of them that they think will lead them into a new phase of power in their lives. Uh, all of these people are promoting... Uh, an incredible arc of narrative in which they interview only each other. And so when you take a look at uh, these people who vouch and validate each other, uh, these are the lowest of the low. And uh, what they uh, promote is, at this point, the kind of fear porn that uh, was uh, that uh, Peter's just articulated for us. It's, it's, it's well, you, I, I, this, this relates to, have you seen a, a commercial uh, for, I don't know how much TV you even are exposed to, but it's a commercial. They ran it quite a bit about a year ago when Trump was first elected, and I actually saw it run for the first time in a long time, uh, a commercial for Trumpy Bear. Have you ever seen the commercial for Trumpy Bear? I never saw it. I never even knew oh, there was such a you product. Would you would love it. It's They call it Trumpy Bear. Get your Trumpy Bear. And it's like a, a teddy bear that's kind of dressed up in you know, some patriotic 
don't know if it's got a red, white, and blue okay. hat or tie, and it's your Trumpy bear, and, and it's it's you know extolling all the the so-called virtues of Donald Trump, and and you want to have this Trumpy bear, and it's it's a completely absurd commercial. It looks like something Saturday Night Live would have produced. I, I was about to ask, are you sure this isn't like a Saturday Night Live skit? It's, it's a genuine commercial. You order your Trumpy bear, and it's for people who like Trump. And I, but I'm saying. The people I know who like Trump would never order a Trumpy bear. It would just they, they wouldn't order it, and they would like him because of, of the way the policies are being run and the economy is is you know uh, better for them. But but none of them would take this serious. It would be it's pandering to the most absurd element in human. Uh, you know, I mean, I I, I mean, but but. The, the whole idea of a of a Trumpy bear is kind of like this teddy bear. Mm. And when people like something like Coast to Coast or Fox News or whatever it is that they like, whether it's their favorite reruns of Cheers or Seinfeld, it's like a it's like a comfort show, a comfort issue. Mm. It's like it's like if the TV goes out in a blackout you've lost your, your teddy bear. You've lost your, your, your reference point. You can't watch TV. Now you have to look inward. And, <laughs> and that be quite disturbing. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, the uh, Qigong teaches you the dark room to go into darkness and, and you know, and, and be with yourself. Uh, and this is a, a process of self-discovery and, and learning. But, so, so anyway, yeah, but but all of the stuff that people watch in media, uh, whether they're liberals or Democrats, whether they like to watch uh, CNN or NFC, MSNBC, it's all like a like a teddy bear effect. It's like it's feel good. It's uh, it has nothing to do with with anything other than comfort, comfort food, comfort you know, comfort attention. And this is what it all comes down to. And, and, you know, when we do first your book on Roswell, that's going to basically upset a lot of apple carts of, of comfort food. Yeah. Like we, you know, we like, I, you know, I grew up as a kid. It's like there was some sort of, I don't know if the words prestige or pride, uh, because I certainly wasn't patriotic, but I was on the side of the Americans just like, you know, if I was watching the Los Angeles Dodgers on television, I would root for them because I was from L.A. Right. And right. And, and so uh, if if. You know, it's, it's just like. So as, as a young boy growing up, uh, oh, yeah, America's never lost a war. Oh, yeah. Oh, and my dad would tell me the history of the different wars as, as he knew them. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, there's some sort of confidence. And then even though you're kind of outgrown this whole mentality of being a child in, in wars, the Vietnam War, it's like, how can we lose this war? You know, it, it seemed like uh, it, it seemed absurd. It's such a small country. It's like, how can you lose this war? And then you realize it's all a bunch of bullshit anyway. Yes. yes. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's all this, this, this game. So, but, but anyway, this book, see what I've learned as a, as a writer and as a publisher, when you put this stuff into writing, it's just like you, you've talked about grammar, grimoire, yes. uh, magical writing. It's, it has an effect when you write something into a book and you spread it. It has a magic unto its own, a sort of subtle component mm -hmm. that is beyond what any individual will read and respond to. That's all great. They will do that. But there is like a component to doing this. And this was why I personally had the book, the Montauk Project, translated into the Spanish language. I hired a Romanian friend who speaks impeccable Spanish. She's a translator between Romanian and Spanish. And she translated, you know, I paid her to translate the book. I edited it myself, which I did a very good job on, considering that I'm not fluent in Spanish. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, the book is okay. Uh, I'm lucky if I've made my money back on what I paid for the translation. But what I realized was to put that book into the Spanish language was very powerful because I, I could never get anybody uh, in any of the Hispanic countries to do it. There was a very sweet lady from Argentina who really tried to help me. Every book fair I would see her, but it could never go anywhere. And so, but what it, this, the, the Spanish language is the language that is completely oppressed and suppressed the Latin culture, the Latin Indian culture, uh, which includes the Incas and the Aztecs and their predecessors, the Mayans. This is the, the, the language which has corrupted the whole Latin American continent. And, 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 and so, so I said, and because uh, it was all tied to, I can't even remember how I tied this to John D. Because John D, by tradition, by what he said, he got what he called the, the smoking mirror, mm. uh, the, the shoe stone, this black obsidian stone. He claimed it was handed down to him from his ancestor named Modoc, mm. Mo, uh, Prince Modoc, and Madoc, Madoc. Mm. Now, Madoc is related to the Modoc Indians, which your father was descended from. Uh, Madoc, and he got this from Prince Madoc. Now, through what I learned from the Montauk Medicine Man, I, I was able to intuit and put together that Prince Madoc was the same character as as the as the, the Montauk Medicine Man referred to as Montauk Pharaoh, a man who came over from Egypt. There is a story uh, by Alan Wilson, an author, that Prince Madoc actually came from Egypt. And he was the brother of King Arthur. And you see all these place names of Madoc and Arthur in Kentucky, which is where the Madoc Indians came up from Alabama, mm -hmm. Mobile Island in Alabama, mm -hmm. by way of Montauk. You have white-haired, blue-eyed Indians. Mm -hmm. And they actually settled in a place called Montauk, Missouri. Mm -hmm. It was named after Montauk, New York that was later day descendants referred to it as Montauk. It's named after Montauk, New York. This is in Missouri. And they moved their way up the Missouri, Mississippi, up into Montana. Mm -hmm. And then if you go, and I learned this in the state capitol in Sacramento. I was in the state capitol, and they have Modoc. These are Modoc Indians of Shasta. They were the last tribe to surrender in California, mm -hmm. the Modoc Indians. This is a name uh, follow through. So anyway, if this Prince Madoc was, he was the one who got this black stone from Quetzalcoatl. Mm -hmm. Quetzalcoatl had a brother named Smoking Mirror, which according to what legend you read, the Smoking Mirror was his foot. He'd look down at his foot and he'd see the black shoe stone, or he had a head that was a, you know, a, a shoe stone, a, a, a scrying stone that you look into and, and see, see things. So that this was uh, by legend. So I, I sort of put together that um, the Spanish language, and this, this, the original stone he got was from the Aztecs or, or mm -hmm. their god. Mm -hmm. So basically, the Spanish language was there to crunch it all down right. it was language uh, used to suppress it, it, it was uh, definitely one of the imperialistic tools by which to uh straitjacket the paradigm uh because we are we are bound by our linguistics and our linguistics uh, uh they're what uh formulate our perception of reality itself uh by the way what i want to do is um i'm going to return in in just a minute and kind of uh uh, take us in a, f a few different directions. I'd like you to continue speaking. Uh, the one thing I'd like you to clarify while, uh, just before I take off to the restroom for a few minutes and then come back, and I'm going to leave you speaking while I do that. And then when I come back, we'll continue talking. And anytime you need to go someplace, you can uh, let me know. Uh, or if you have to take off for the night, because of course it's getting later where you're at, though you were able to stay up with us quite late the other night. I'm not quite sure if you it's enjoyed it. It's 10.33 now. It's 10.33. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can so at least a while. Okay, good, good. And, um, 
but uh, my um, the tribe that I was always familiar with in terms of my father's uh, uh, Mandan, Mandan, Mandan. Yeah, that's right. So they are. So they then are subsidiary to the Modoc, is what you're saying. Is, they're all. They're all. The names are all related. Understood. I can... Okay, I I get it now. That makes sense. So, I I forgot. Yeah, Mandan. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I mean that was the name I was familiar with, but now you're right. That is, and I I I, I forgot, but it, it, I remembered Mandan. It was. It's connected. They're all connected. Understood. Thank you for clarifying that. Deeply appreciate it. So do me a favor, uh, dip into the chat room and uh, you can take a look at what they're saying and answer some of the questions. I'll be back. I'm going to go mute for, uh, and I should be back in the longest, it'd be about seven minutes. Uh, should be back in about, uh, um, you know, five uh, to seven minutes. So I'm going to leave everyone in the hands of Peter Moon for that period of time. Uh, and thank God he's with us tonight because I just was not there. But I'll try and get more into it now. And he's helped me to do that uh, with uh, his addressing uh, so many issues of, uh, of significance. Uh, and uh, one of those being, of course, the fear porn that's generated by Coast to Coast AM. And God knows what their intent is behind that. Uh, well, most of the people that they're dealing with are, are uh, Trump supporters. These are the elderly. These are uh, basically the disenfranchised, uh, homebound, uh, disabled welfare recipient, uh, uh, primarily, almost overwhelmingly, uh, white, uh, Caucasian, European, American, uh, uh, lower level income uh, trash <laughs> that they cater to. And so it's no surprise to me that they just feed them fear porn because that's part of what keeps them loving Trump. Trump is their man who will take care of their fears. Trump is their Trumpy bear. Trump is the man who will answer their insecurities. He's the, um, the, the man who's, uh, oh my God. When I come back, remind me to Sedgway back into the conversation by telling you the person who approached me after Niall Parkinson left. Uh, now that Niall Parkinson's essentially been disenfranchised, uh, they, they, they sent someone else now to try and move in and uh, try to ingratiate himself on my program, uh, asking to be interviewed. And, uh, it, and, 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 and the technique that they use uh, is uh, just part of the... Uh, it's the same old fallback uh, that they always have. Uh, this person who was trying to approach me to get on my program was saying his mother was a high priestess in the Temple of Set. And it's it's like, you know, like people say these things. And with, with now Parkinson, it was like, oh, I was born dead like Aquino was. Uh, and I never shared this with anyone before in my life. This is right after he had shared it, of course, with uh, John Warrington. Uh, so he apparently shares this with everyone and tells them about how he never shares this with anyone in his life. That they was born dead. And, and the fact that they would think that I would have someone on my program because of that. I mean, just like like that's an accomplishment. Like like what the fuck? It's not like the guy tried to be born dead or that uh, it, it's just like, um, you know, it's like being born with uh, polydactylism, you know, six fingers and six toes. Uh, it, it, it's something that may have some significance in the occult sense, but it doesn't really mean that you're worth anything. <laughs> All that different intrinsically because of that. And uh, it, it's, you know, for someone to just say, oh, my mom was a high priestess of the temple set, like, um, really? Really? Like, uh, I, I mean, uh, Lilith, the wife of uh, Michael Aquino, uh, was an extraordinarily jealous woman. I do not personally remember any other high priestess in the temple of set aside from her. As a matter of fact, it's almost overwhelmingly uh, a male population because every female that joined would wind up suing, suing Michael Aquino uh, because of the sexual molestations and uh, assaults that they would suffer from all of the otherwise involuntarily celibate men who were part of the organization. Uh, so uh, how would one, uh, aside from Lilith, who had privilege of, of course, being married to the guy in charge, the guy found at the church, how would they get to the level where they'd be called a high priestess? Uh, would they tolerate multiple rapes? Uh, I mean, oh my God, it's just the shit I get confronted with. Uh, and, 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 and um, you know, the, the problem is I'm really just too nice a guy. I should never have bothered responding to this person in the first place with even just acknowledging them with, uh, you know, just a simple, oh, I return your respect in turn. The way they were approaching me was in this manner that was, I, I take it, supposed to be the opposite of now Parkinson, who was uh, slimy, sleazy, schmoozing. Uh, this person came on as just uh, 
basically borderline insane. So apparently they're supposed to seem more or less less threatening or less sinister or less uh, studied or conspiratorial in their approach. So maybe I would just open up and uh, just let them on air, you know, that kind of thing. But but there's a concerted effort to get someone on my show that's going to ambush me. There's a concerted, concerted effort to do this. And uh, it, it uh, of course, was done originally by Daryl Hamamoto, the Jap trash piece of shit, who was a Japanese American who uh, was a Trump cultist, a pronounced Trump cultist, and was shouting MAGA or Make America Great Again prior 2016. Uh, we're talking about in the year 2015 he was doing this. And his reward for ambushing me on my own program on Revolution Radio was interviews with Alex Jones, which people went out of their way to actually enter comments on my YouTube video saying, oh, he was on Alex Jones before he ambushed you on your program. No, no, he wasn't. <laughs> if you actually take a look at the dates in which Daryl Hamamoto attacked me on my own program, I, of course, was totally dismembered. Uh, I eviscerated him uh, because of his, his miscomprehension of the facts was so astronomically inverted from reality it was it wasn't even an accomplishment uh but that uh he he was claiming that uh david irving the holocaust denier had uh, uh basically been sued uh by um i believe her name was uh lipman or um a uh, lipman so i'd have to look her up but she was a jewish american authoress who wrote history books and um she was sued by david irving and she won the lawsuit. He sued her out of England, knowing it'd be difficult for an American to counter sue from across the Atlantic. But she actually went to England, faced the lawsuit of David Irving, and she won. And uh, in terms of uh, this idiot, Daryl Hamamoto, who himself was a Holocaust denier, he was convinced that she had sued David Irving. And he had the whole situation bass backwards, upside down, invert it, uh, the typical satanic inversion, as Michael Aquino called it, that is, of course, the leap motif of everything these people do. And this guy had been so satanically inverted, he was just thrown in front of me as cannon fodder, apparently for me to rip apart. And uh, this is like uh, the kind of shit I deal with. And I guess they're trying to set up something like that again, where there's another ambush on my own program so they keep throwing these people at me first now parkinson and but the appeal that they use since they can't send a japanese american my way anymore because since they know i'm not first off japanese americans are unicorns there's none of them left they're bred out of existence but um if they send someone uh, else towards me they can't use the asian approach so they're just going to use white men who say they were born dead or uh guys who claim to be native american like the na latest one um who say their mother was a high priestess of the Temple of Set, which in and of itself says everything you need to know. Uh, racists and white supremacists as are the very fiber of an exclusive organization like the Temple of Set. The idea that a Native American, uh, oh, unless his mother was white, uh, would have someone whose uh, mom is a high priestess in the Temple of Set is, is part of the surrealist absurdity that... Uh, I have to deal with and people approaching me. Anyhow, just a hint. I've got some good news for you, Douglas. Oh, what's that? Uh, this this gentleman I told you about's interested in in having you. He wants your contact info uh, to, to 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 write to you. He says, oh. "How can I contact Douglas? How should I tell him to contact you?" Oh, um, well, uh, via your Facebook identity. Uh, yeah, you may as well. And, uh, tell him through there. And also, um, he can contact me through the website, uh, should be, uh, he should be able to reach my, uh, web mistress, Lena Shea, my manager through. The, through is is the information on the website? It, yes, it is. It's the, my, even my personal mailing address is on the website. So he should be able to, but you just give him my Facebook identity, the Sora Aoi timeline. And, uh, that was gifted to me and, um, he can uh, contact me through that directly. And uh, oh, so, so long okay. as he says he's the individual who's working with yourself on uh, the potential presentation, then I'll be happy to work. I'm actually shocked. <laughs> uh, uh, it's it, well, it's 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 pleasant. It's good. Thing, things are going, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Why don't you go uh, do what you have to do? Yes. for seven minutes, and I will. Uh, 
keep the audience you know, keep the audience informed. Yeah, yes. and, I'll, and I'll I'll just tell them tell them a little bit uh, about how many people are we talking to now. Oh well, remember whatever you see in the chat room is just a shadow of what's really listening. Because the moment we go off air, you're going to see that that there's like usually three to four hundred people who are watching. They'll say that immediately when I see it says it says fifty five watching now, yeah. which might mean a hundred and more. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So I will. Uh, you you go do what you have to do, and I will. Uh, you know. To tell the people what's going on in regards to that. Right. Sounds good. And uh, thank you so much. I'll be right back. Okay. So anyway, uh, what what I had uh, received an invitation uh, this morning, which was very interesting. Usually I'm very lukewarm <laughs> or neutral about invitations anywhere. But uh, this one really hit the mark. And it's uh, to... Um, a conference that will be June 18th to the 22nd. And it will be I'm trying to think what it's called so I can refer you to it. Um, why am I having a hard time finding it? Oh, here it is. Um, it is called the Living Truth Summit in Mount Shasta. The Living Truth Summit in Mount Shasta. You can look that up online and find the website. Uh, I think he has an offer, a free gift for people who sign up early. I have no idea what it costs to get there. Um, but this is very special because I told him he needed a couple more speakers and now he needs one more. And I, I, I told him, yes, I'd be happy to do it because it will give me uh, a opportunity to, to return to California, to Northern California, uh, and not only visit Douglas, and by that time, I should be well into Roswell and the Rising Sun, the, the book that I'm going to write with him, uh, and if not done with it, I don't know if I can be done that soon. But uh, also, in addition to visiting him, and I, I would ideally like to explore Chinatown with him, because uh, I will definitely be going to Chinatown and, and doing my investigations there, and also going to the gold country of California and the gold country means that, you know, I'll probably base myself out of Sonora, uh, and go to Yosemite. Yosemite is a site where there's an Indian reservation there where, uh, Radu Sinemar visited with his, uh, mentor and colleague Caesar Brad, uh, and they, they explored a, vortex connection there and that's uh i would like and and the chief of the indian tribe the miwok indians his last name was wilson and the wilson family is also i encountered their legacy not them themselves the legacy when i had last visited uh that area in particular west point not west point that you're familiar with with the academy that West Point uh, in California, a small little tiny little uh, town, if we can even call it a town, which is where um, Carl Germer, Aleister Crowley's successor in the OTO or Ordo Templi, Ordo Templi Orientis settled. And uh, why the heck did he go to that place, which is so obscure? But uh, I was curious to visit there, and I did, and I, uh, you know, discovered some that the, the whole Wilson family were predominantly there. Now I discover that the Wilsons are married into the Indian clan. And for those of you who have read my books, know that the name Wilson has been a key to very many things. L. Ron Hubbard, coming from the Wilson clan, which I discovered as well as Marjorie Cameron. Marjorie Wilson was her original name. And she was adopted by her uncle, raised by her uncle, Cam whose last name was Cameron. And that's how she acquired the name Cameron. So anyway, that's uh, this Living Truth Summit in Mount Shasta is something I'm very much looking forward to. And also, while I'm there, parlaying it into um, a chance to investigate some of uh, my most interesting uh, haunts in San Francisco Bay Area, as well as um, 
the gold country of California. Now, I wanted uh, to share something. You know, Douglas talks a lot about grimoire or grammar, which is essentially a magical text um, that one reads to create a magical effect. And I'm currently working on a book that's almost done, and I hope to release it in the next few months simultaneously with the book uh, Forgotten Genesis by Radu Sinemar. Last year, I released two books. They were um, the Silver Anniversary Edition of the Montauk Project Experiments in Time, and at the same time, I released Radu Sinemar's fifth book, Inside the Earth, The Second Tunnel. This year, I will be releasing two books. The book I just mentioned, Forgotten Genesis by Radu Sinemar, and L. Ron Hubbard, The Tao of Insanity by myself, Peter Moon. Well, one of the hallmarks or most important things in Dianetics is something called the engram. The engram is, a, is defined as a moment of pain and unconsciousness in Scientology text, and, and basically it's an area that you that would be holding you back or impeding you in some way, and you go in and counseling to investigate that uh, and dissipate it and take it back to its source and, and then relieve all the trauma that was attached to it. Now, very interesting part, because I was looking at the, for this book, to understand the word engram and the etymology of the term. The regular English medical usage of the word engram signifies, a, and, and this has a magical context to it when we go through all the definitions. An engram, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is a hypothetical change in neural tissue postulated, in other words, they're postulating this hypothetical change in neural tissue in order to account for persistence of memory. In other words, the neural tissue is changed and it's this change in the neural tissue that accounts for a persistence in memory. Now this implies that neural tissue itself has a memory. Certainly if you punch a piece of neural tissue, it's going to feel something and it's going to have a response to that. Whether the memory is actually in the the tissue itself or is in an independent body is something you could debate or consider or investigate. This is just a hypothetical change in neural tissue because of the memory. So if you get, you know, punched, you might have a great resistance and you might react psychologically to where, or even physically, the physical tissue might be vulnerable or whatnot where you were punched. Uh, much like, um, you know, like stigmata or something, you know, somebody's got this stuff coming out of their wrists. Uh, but the original term engram is credited to have originated with a German scholar, Richard Seaman, S-E-M-O-N, in 1904, who defined it as a stimulus impression, which could be reactivated by the recurrence of the energetic conditions which ruled at the generation of the engram. I'll read that again. It's Richard Seaman in 1904, German scholar is defining it as a stimulus impression which could be reactivated by the recurrence of the energetic conditions which ruled at the generation of the engram. So it's the whole idea of the impression that you had at the time of this impingement on the neural tissue recreating itself. So if something caused you a headache, you would reactivate it, like you know, a punch, it's coming back to you and you're having a headache now and it's years after that incident happened. It's the reactivation. And of course Hubbard was parlaying off these definitions when he used this word. He originally called it in his early writings an impediment. And he changed it to engram because I assume he had changed it because it sounded more scientific and was more in alignment with uh, 
scientific investigations into what changed cell cellular structure or cellular behavior. Cellular the most interesting. Yes, thank you. Go yes. Ahead. Now, now this is now this is the most interesting aspect. Of, I'm glad you're back because I want so I want I want you to hear the most interesting aspect of the word engram at least with regard to this narrative about magic, because the book is about magic and the interconnections between magic and Scientology, which are not well understood at all. The, is that the etymology from the Oxford Dictionary for the word engram states that it was coined in German from the Greek en, en, meaning, you spell engram, e-n-g-r-a-m, g-r-a-m, e-n-g-r-a-m. It's coined in German from the Greek en, meaning within. That's what en means, within. And gramma, and gramma, G-R-A-M-M-A, referring to grammar or a letter of the alphabet. The very idea of an engram or stimulus upon an organism is embedded with the idea of a letter or a series of letters, such as in a word or a spell, impinging upon a life form. And so, in other words, you have, in the word engram, you have a gram, like grammar, is, is a series of letters or words. So you have words impinging upon an organism. So this is like, this is right out of magic. Mm -hmm. Right out of magic. And further, another aspect is Hubbard himself said, what holds the engram together from a conceptual standpoint is what calls a postulate and in Scientology a postulate is a decision uh, a resolution a, a, a cognition it's it's just like you're deciding something and it's just like uh, it's gonna be this way so you you get hurt and you say uh, it's gonna be a hell of a day because I just got hit and you're walking around thinking it's gonna and then you say a hell of a day in a bad way it's going to be a horrendous day and you're just walking around in depression because you have this horrendous, horrendous mindset. And of course, a concept goes hand in hand with letters. Everything conceptually was senior to letters. That's very important for people who are struggling with grimoire or grammar where people are doing magic spells against them. Right. It's, and it's no different than the idea of positive thinking. Uh, and thinking and or prayer where you're actually conceiving of stuff to overcome the words or vibrations that have been inflicted upon you by circumstance, magic spells or whatever. So that's what I wanted to share. And, and you can continue from here. Oh, yes. Well, very much also remember that words cast spells. That's why it's called spelling. You know, yep. You're spelling people. You're casting spells. This is why words can work a magic. This is why they say some great speakers are casting a spell. That they. Uh, this is why Hitler was looked upon as a kind of a uh, magician and uh, and and someone who was able to have a uh, almost sorceress uh, influence over his audience. All of this is taking uh, the medievalist concepts of the grimoire, the, the grammar and the uh, spell casting via spelling, the, the use of words and incantation. And uh, so uh, through the um, Dianetics that uh, Peter is describing, the, what they're talking about is, of course, breaking the spell. And uh, so uh, I assume, of course, that Peter himself uh, went through the whole process where uh, he cleared himself of engrams and uh, went through all of the uh, the tests with what are essentially polygraphs that uh, the auditors are using. Or, or, or did all that kind of evolve later? Did that come in with? No, 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 no. I mean, there were different stages because as Hubbard, uh, you know, it, it's like if you knew Hubbard or understood him, uh, his whole mentality was completely different than the way it's rendered, uh, especially by many of his supporting people who were one time ardent followers. Uh, but the, the followers were, you know, follower. They were too and too much following rather than thinking. Uh, but in any case, um, the, the subject was always a developing subject. Mm -hmm. And he would apologize for the fact that people are being decimated by the subject. He says, this is a growing subject. It's a new subject. It's, uh, it's going to take a long time for this to catch on. 
So he wasn't, uh, you know, he was some, you know, apologetic. Uh, and this was like almost like an internally apologetic. He wasn't like, you know, putting this out, broadcasting it to the universe and saying, you know, this is this is what happens when you, you do something like this. He was very, I guess his perspective was very, um, you know, much more self-reflective than people would think. But it, it's just things just were the way they were. But to get back to your question, you, you get back. Uh, yes, I, I spent uh, hundreds upon hundreds of hours. I can't tell you how many hundreds of hours I spent. It might have been a thousand hours of probably easily was a thousand hours of getting counseled and and uh, to relieve oneself of basically what is inside one's head. Uh, and what is inside one's head is varies from individual to individual. At the same time, I counseled people for thousands of hours and saw all sorts of different people and saw how what was inside their heads. And one of the most beneficial things that I received is when I was doing both at the same time, going deep inside of my own mind-body-soul complex to relieve myself of... Um, what was bothering me and I was very it all started with utterly devastated by my first marriage which didn't work out um, and then I was repaired from that and then once I was repaired from that they kept going and they kept helping me and helping me and helping me and I was going deep and deeper and at the same time I was auditing other people and really getting to see how people's minds work and the games of life that that we play, but one of the one of the things that made me a very adaptable preclear, as they called it, is I would I would counsel some people, and oh, they would get along just great. They would laugh, they would relieve themselves, and I don't mean relieve themselves <laughs> physically. Uh, they would relieve themselves of great burdens, and they would laugh with joy, uh, and and you'd see how they would approach. The subject of auditing and it was just natural for them there were other people who would grind and who were very sluggish and their uh responsiveness was much lower it wasn't absent but it was uh you know it's it's just like i think when it, when a coach sees somebody in a on a on an athletic team and he'll notice by the body language of the people who were the better players and he'll, he'll spend their time on them. Mm. And, uh, and he might teach the other, uh, athletes to, to be more like these people, you know, get some of their attributes. So basically I'm sitting there counseling these people, um, hours and hours a day. And I see different types of people. Uh, some of them are sharp. Some of them are not sharp. Some of them, but, but I noticed that they all, the ones that were really doing well and their counseling had a certain um, attitude. And because you can be very, I guess what you call introspective and, you know, sort of like think that you have to think, you know, almost be magical in yourself or you're not satisfying yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like going out, you know, trying to learn the martial arts and think you're going to be like Bruce Lee on the first day. You know, you're not. Right. And um, so anyway, I said, wow, I'm just going to be like these people. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to make things difficult for myself. And all of a sudden I could respond so much better to the auditor or counselor, which is the name for the counselor. Audit means to listen. The auditor was the listener. So I could I could respond so much better and play the game because it, it doesn't mean like, say, some people have taken great issue over the fact that Hubbard says in the Dianetics book that your IQ goes up about, you know, one hour per hour, one point per hour of processing or auditing. OK. And they say, oh, it doesn't do that. <laughs> OK. So like I remember when I went in. I was considered a high IQ person. And then I, because of different access I had, and I, I was at a lot of specialized posts or jobs, 
I, I was one time, and I wasn't necessarily supposed to see it, but it was put out right in front of me by happenstance. Mm -hmm. I saw my IQ had gone up um, 23 points. Mm -hmm. That's that's a, a great resurgence. Now, I had more than 23 hours of processing. Mm -hmm. So should I complain that it didn't go up one point? You know, it didn't go up a thousand points, you know, <laughs> it, you know, it's like, wow, that's pretty remarkable. And did I feel smarter? Yeah, I felt a lot smarter on, on many different, many different levels. I was smarter than I had been. Now, you could call some of that maturity. You could call it a lot of things. But um, so, yeah, I had benefited greatly. And um cleared out a lot of in fact I'm, I'm just writing a chapter now on on white noise which is the sum total of all frequencies to find Preston Nichols was an expert in white noise and basically what if there was a crowning glory to my Scientology experience is when I left Scientology I was very happy to live out the rest of my life in, in relative balance that I would die, that I would never have to reincarnate again and, and be a great peace. And I even had a taste of that when I had an out-of-body experience, when I actually had fainted in a chiropractic clinic when they were taking my blood. I was watching them do it, not, not embarrassed about it or shy about it, but I fainted. And I, I totally went out of my body, and I, I was in utter peace. And I recognized that I was in utter peace. I said, wow, this is just like I knew it was. Ah, I want to stay here forever. And then I thought of my wife. I said, if I die, my wife's going to be so distraught. So I came back. And the next thing I knew, I looked up and I saw that they were they were in a panic. And, and I heard, hey, he's having a seizure. He's having a seizure. And I looked up and finally figured out they were talking about me. Uh, when in actual fact, I was not having a seizure. I had just fainted. And I couldn't talk. And I was motioning them with my hands to know them I was okay. And then my talk voice came back. And I said, I'm okay. And uh, they said, oh, 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 okay. And then they, they figured out that I just fainted. Because, you know, I was looking at my blood being extracted. Mm. I wasn't afraid to look at it. And so nowadays when I get my blood taken, I lay down and I don't look. Right, right. So I learned that because it was a reaction. It wasn't like me being afraid to. It's like, who, who, who needs that? So um, that was sort of a validation of what I had learned. And then, of course, um, I meet Preston Nichols and everything L. Ron Hubbard said about electron implantation of spirits with electronics came uh, full circle. In other words, all that stuff Hubbard was talking about, uh, here is Hub uh, Preston talking about it, but in a much more... Uh, I guess what you'd say heightened version that was happening in real time, more or less real time, because Hubbard talked about it occurring uh, back what he called the whole track, past lives and whatnot. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that also there was extensive counseling on incidents where you were being implanted with electronics. Now, what does that mean? It's very akin to imagination. If you imagine, if you have a headache and, and you say, okay, is there an incident of you having, uh, you know, a pain in the head? And, and you're doing this in a deep reverie. And you go back and you visualize being in an electric chair. And all of a sudden, yeah, it's causing a lot of pain in your head. And, and then, okay, is there an earlier time? And you go back and you think of your head being chopped with an ax in an execution scene. And sometimes these incidents would come on with great what they called visio, right. where you would see the stuff. Right. It these these on, are like precarnations that are that you, yes. you relive. Okay, go on. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and and it, it was my first real dianetic auditing session that was very spectacular. When I would go back, and and I went back into the time of the Knights Templar. I was writing with a red cross. Now keep in mind. I didn't know what a Templar was at the age of 18 when this was occurring. I know I never read about the Knights Templar. They weren't famous then. That's right. Okay. Yes. I didn't know what they were, but I had an incident where I was writing with a like a knight with a red cross. 
and uh, I get upended. I get in this this huge sword fight, and I have a a, a sword go through my throat where, where it wasn't protected in the armor. Now, I, I was addressing the problem of a sore throat. I used to have nasty sore throats uh, during the, the winter months of uh, in the Sacramento Valley. It would be very nasty, and they hurt like hell. And I don't remember taking off school. You went to school with a sore throat. You know, that's just how it was. Right. And anyway, uh, this relieved. It re- and all this charge around my throat just like dissipated. I go, what the hell is this? It was like free. And I, and I was like laughing uh, and complete relief of some of pain I didn't even know I had. Uh, of course, and, and the throat to this day has never come back. That, that sore throat has never come back. And it was like, wow. And I just, all of a sudden, I knew this stuff worked. And... Uh, in fact, it, it was later determined that I had 